overcome insecurity and even physical illness through changing negative false belief systems. And as you master the totally practical step-by-step -step exercises, you'll find that you'll be enjoying positive results in every aspect of your life. Let me start out by giving you a little background information. The Silver Mind Control Method was pioneered by Jose Silva of Laredo, Texas, over a 22-year period between 1944 and 1966. His initial interest in mind development was sparked when he was inducted into the army during World War II and, like all the other soldiers, had to take a series of psychological tests. Silva was absolutely fascinated by the kind of test questions he was asked to respond to, and he ended up interviewing the army psychiatrist about the field of mind development. The psychiatrist recommended Silva start his exploration by reading the works of Freud, Jung, and Adler, and this began his lifelong commitment to scientific research into the potential of the human mind. During his studies, he became interested in methods of raising IQ scores. This interest was especially fueled by some failing grades that had begun to appear on his children's report cards, so Jose decided to find out if he could improve his children's learning abilities and their IQs in particular, through a series of mental training exercises. To begin with, he knew that the brain generates different frequencies of electricity. From his work in the field of electronics, he knew that the ideal circuit is the one with the least resistance, because it makes the greatest use of its electrical energy. Working with his own children, he concluded that the brain received and stored more information at lower brain frequencies. He began experimenting with a series of mental training exercises to do just that, to slow down the brain frequency while remaining mentally alert. I'll be explaining how this works in more detail in a moment. Now, Laredo is a small town. When Jose's neighbors heard from their children that the Silva kids were getting much higher grades, they approached him about teaching their children the same techniques. So over a 10-year period, Jose taught a group of local children how to function at these lower brain frequencies. With each class, he had the opportunity to polish and expand his mind control methods and received even better and better results. The next step was working with adults. By 1966, his classes evolved into a comprehensive training program and Silva started to teach a 36-hour course to the general public. In 1969, the demand for the training became so great that Silva could no longer handle all the teaching by himself, and he trained a group of instructors to help him teach the Silva mind control method. And that was the beginning of the popularization of the world's most famous mind training course. First it spread across the USA, and eventually around the world. Since 1966, the 36-hour Silva Method course has been given worldwide, and now in the 1990s, it is taught in every major city in North America, as well as in 79 other countries in 20 different languages. It has proven to be life-transforming for millions of people from every walk of life worldwide. Why has the Silva Mind Control Method become the most successful mind training program in the world? The answer is very simple. It works. By learning to direct and control your mental powers, you will have the skills to achieve your goals. Whether they are personal, social, or professional, you'll enjoy enhanced energy to accomplish what you want in life, you'll increase your self-esteem so that you function successfully in the world, and, bottom line, you'll be happier. These might sound like huge promises, but let me assure you that if you take the time to master these exercises, and use the principles involved, you will see positive changes take shape in every area of your life. Also, you'll learn an effective method for stress control 
by taking a mental vacation at this alpha level. Then you'll learn how to eliminate the negative patterns and belief systems that can sabotage your self-respect, health, performance, and relationships. You'll learn how to maintain a positive attitude and create positive belief systems through a second alpha meditation. Finally, you'll enjoy a powerful mental training exercise called the Long Relaxation Exercise, designed to help you strengthen your immune system, keep you mentally centered, dramatically increase your creativity, and literally awaken the genius within you. Over the next two hours, in addition to leading you through a series of exercises, you'll be joining me in one of my seminars, where I'll be explaining various concepts that form the backbone of the Silver Mind Control Method. So let's begin as we now step into the class for an explanation of how the brain and mind work. As you can see on the chart, there are four levels here, beta level, alpha, theta, and, and delta. And the line that runs up and down shows brain rhythm in cycles per second. It shows brain activity as measured through EEG equipment. EEG is an electroencephalograph that measures brain activity very similarly to what an EKG does for the heart. You're familiar with EKG measuring heart activity. It measures the heart in so many beats per minute, as the heart functions in beats per minute. The brain functions in cycles per second. So your brain vibrates in so many cycles per second. The way we are now, with eyes open, wide awake, focused, the brain is probably right around 20, 21 cycles per second as measured on EEG equipment. That brain activity is called beta brain activity, or outer conscious levels of the mind. It's a world of action where we go and do things. It's a doing level. You have the physical world with the five senses operative, sight, sound, smell, touch and taste, are fully operative at that level. And time and space as a measuring device as it took you so many minutes to get here, to drive or to walk or whatever you did from your home. And space-wise, you went through so many miles to go from place A to place B. Now, when you slow down the brain activity, you then, in effect, enter different brain frequencies. If you slow down, you first go through the alpha brain frequency. As you further slow down, you go through the theta level. And then finally, delta. And the numbers go down. In other words, from 20 cycles functioning as beta when you're awake to deep sleep, the brain could be one, two cycles per second. It is deep sleep. So there's a tremendous difference between when you're fully alert and awake and when you're deeply asleep. Alpha, theta, and delta are all three connected with sleep. So those are the three levels that you normally sleep through. Over here, beta is the awake brain frequency level. While we have outer conscious levels of beta here, we have inner conscious levels at alpha and theta. Now, some people will say, why don't you call the inner conscious level subconscious levels? Because maybe they have had that kind of terminology when they went to school or took a psychology course or are in the field of psychiatry or psychology. They're used to the terminology of subconscious. Sub meaning below the, the conscious level. So first of all, we don't use that term because once you learn how to use your mind at the inner conscious levels of the mind, it's no longer hidden. So for somebody who is untrained, this would be subconscious. When you're done with the training, you'll be functioning at the inner conscious levels because you're doing it while you are mentally aware. You're not going to be asleep. You're going to be awake while using these levels. So what we are going to learn then is to slow down the brain activity from about 20 cycles till about mid-alpha, to put a number to approximately 10 cycles per second. We want to function at the mid-alpha range. This is where you can make strong impressions on the brain. And that's what we want to do, right? When you have a goal in mind, you want to create a strong impression on the brain pertaining to your goal so that the brain and the mind is helping you to achieve your goal. In order to learn how to do that, we have mental training exercises. We're going to do specific mental training exercises throughout the 36 hours where we're going to go in and out of these levels. 
And the key is we're going to learn how to go here, remain mentally awake, alert, and in control while there. And then learn to apply techniques while at that level. Now that you have some understanding of the different brainwave frequencies, you're ready for the first mental training exercise. It's a very brief one, about five minutes. First I'll describe and explain the words and phrases I'll be using in this exercise. This is to satisfy the left hemisphere of your brain, the part that is ascribed to logical, analytical thinking. Then I'll guide you through the exercise. And as you slow down the brain activity, producing more alpha brain waves, you'll activate the creative and intuitive right brain hemisphere. So you'll be learning at the beta or logical level and applying what you have learned at the alpha intuitive level. Let's begin with the beta or left brain explanation of this mental exercise. I'm going to ask you to assume a comfortable sitting position. Sitting in a chair is best. Make sure that your clothing isn't too tight. If you're wearing a tight belt, for instance, loosen it up. Kick up your shoes. It is important that you feel physically at ease. When you sit in a chair, rest your back against the back of the chair. You'll find you'll be much more comfortable if you keep your arms and legs uncrossed throughout the duration of these mental training exercises. Remember, these exercises will require your full attention. Do not attempt to do any of them while driving a car or operating any machinery. Once you've found a comfortable position, I'm going to be asking you to take a deep breath and exhale to enter a deeper level of mind. Now, when I ask you to take a deep breath, I really mean it. I really want you to take a deep breath. And the way to take a deep breath is not to pull in your stomach and stick out your chest like a soldier. The proper way to take a deep breath is to fill your lungs and let your stomach expand as you inhale, so that the air can go all the way down into the solar plexus region. This will help you to successfully reach your alpha brain frequency level. So let's practice this for a moment. Take a deep breath, and as you inhale like this, push, not force, push your stomach out, and then gently exhale. Good. Now, continuing with my beta description of what this first exercise will involve, after I ask you to take a deep breath, I'm going to count backwards from 10 to 1 slowly. And just imagine that you're feeling yourself relax more and more as I count backwards. After that, I'm going to ask you to relax your eyelids. As you may know, there are thousands of tiny muscles in the eyelids, and one of the primary areas for tension is the eyelids. By letting go of whatever stress or tension may be in the eyelids, you can evoke the feeling of relaxation. After you have done that, I'm going to ask you to allow this feeling of relaxation to flow slowly downward, all the way down to your toes. Next, I'm going to ask you to mentally go to an ideal place of relaxation. Now, an ideal place of relaxation could be a place that you already have visited, such as sitting at a beach, or being in the mountains, or any place where you have been where you have felt very relaxed mentally and physically. If you cannot think of such a place, or do not know of such a place, you can mentally create one. In the Southern California area, we also hold children's classes from time to time, and one of the favorite places of relaxation for the children is a big fat cloud in the sky, right in the middle of it, gently floating. So feel free to be as creative as you'd like to be in designing the location of your mental vacation. I'll be quiet for a while so that you can enjoy this place of relaxation, and then I will tell you it's going to feel like an hour of relaxation. And even though I'm going to be quiet in regular clock time, a lot less than that, you will find that it actually feels as though you relaxed for an hour or so. Let's begin.
We will begin this exercise by asking you to assume a comfortable sitting position. Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and as you exhale, enter a deeper level of mind. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from 10 to 1. On each descending number, you will feel yourself going deeper, and you will enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. 10, 9, feel going deeper. 8, 7, 6, deeper and deeper. 5, 4, 3, deeper and deeper. 2, 1. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. You may enter a deeper, healthier level of mind by simply relaxing your eyelids. Relax your eyelids. Feel how relaxed they are. Allow this feeling of relaxation to flow slowly downward throughout your body, all the way down to your toes. It is a wonderful feeling to be deeply relaxed, a very healthy state of being. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from one to three. At that moment, you will project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation. I will then stop talking to you, and when you next hear my voice, one hour of time will have elapsed at this level of mind. My voice will not startle you. You will take a deep breath, relax, and go deeper. One, two, three. Project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation until you hear my voice again. Relax. Relax, take a deep breath, and go deeper. You will continue to listen to my voice. You will continue to follow the instructions at this level of the mind and any other level, including the outer conscious level. This is for your benefit. You desire it, and it is so. Whenever you mentally or verbally mention the word relax, all Unnecessary movements and activities of your body, brain, and mind will cease immediately, and you will become completely passive and relaxed physically and mentally. I may bring you out of this level or a deeper level than this by counting to you from one to five. At the count of five, your eyes will open, you will be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health. The difference between genius mentality and lay mentality is that geniuses use more of their minds and use them in a special manner. You are now learning to use more of your mind and to use it in a special manner. In the next longer Silva exercise, we will impress and program beneficial statements for your benefit. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At that moment, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You will have no ill effects whatsoever in your head, no headache, no ill effects whatsoever in your hearing, no buzzing in your ears, no ill effects whatsoever in your vision and eyesight. Vision, eyesight, and hearing improve every time you function at these levels of mind. One, two... Coming out slowly now. Three, at the count of five, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Feeling the way you feel when you have slept, the right amount of revitalizing, refreshing, 
relaxing, healthy sleep. Four, five. Eyes open, wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You notice during this last exercise that I read a statement pertaining to genius. Geniuses are individuals who use more of their minds and use them in a special manner. In simple terms, what I mean by that is that they use both parts of their brain for whole brain thinking. And you are now learning the skills to do just that. Does this mean I'm telling you that you're a genius? The answer is, yes indeed, you are a genius. Now, you may not be aware of this fact. If you don't know you possess a talent, then you can't make deliberate use of it. What you're learning in this program is how to activate that part of the brain that people more and more consider to be responsible for genius-like qualities, such as creativity, intuition, imagination, and visualization. And by learning to go into that alpha dimension, as you are doing, you will find that those qualities will improve and you'll become better at accessing them any time you wish. Next, let's move on to negative self-programming. That is, when you think and talk about yourself, your loved ones, or the world at large in a negative manner. You can get into real problems with this self-sabotaging habit, because when you repeat something often enough, you actually start attracting what you do not want, creating a lot of unhappiness and problems in your life. You see, what you believe is true for you. If you believe a thing firmly, then it is your reality then, is it not? Sure. If somebody believes that Monday is the worst day of the week, what kind of a day do they have on Monday? Going to have a bad day. If you were to tell the person that that is not true, that Mondays are not the worst day of the week, what will they tell you? They'll insist upon it. They'll say, what do you mean? And now you're going to hear their reasons as to why this is so. You see, you and I are very good at coming up for reasons for our belief systems. If you go talk to people of the Flat Earth Society, they're going to give you wonderful reasons as to why the Earth is flat. Very nice, intellectual, intelligent reasons. If you ask a person why they have lousy days on Mondays, they're going to give you wonderful reasons as to why. Somebody might say something like this. All the work has been carrying over from the weekend. And when, you know, you've been gone for a couple of days. And then when you come back on Monday, you're a little behind from the stuff you left behind from last week. And then, you know, you don't really feel like working. So you sort of have to get into that between what you are behind and getting into the swing of things. Boy, you're going to have a rough day on Monday. Now, this sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, I believe it. But it has nothing to do with the truth, does it? Because there are a lot of people who think that Monday is just like any other day. So what happened to their Saturdays and Sundays and getting into the swing of things? What happened? In other words, it is a personal justification that has nothing to do with the reality. Now let me tell you what you and I do. You and I come up with personal justifications why we do or why we do not do things. And those reasons we have have also nothing to do with the reality. The reasons are manufactured by us, and the more intelligent you are, the better your reasons. Right? Now, all those reasons are false. And if you catch yourself doing that, where you come up with your reasons, I'm going to give you a little phrase to use instead. Say to yourself, the reason I'm not doing X, Y, or Z is because the sky is blue. <laughs> Because that reason is just as good as any other one you're going to come up with. Because usually we use our reasons to help sell the idea to ourselves and to the people who are listening to us. Let me tell you why I didn't get the work done. Because so-and-so called, and this happened, and then that happened. 
and I didn't have the time to do it. Oh, okay. That sounds like a good reason to me. The real reason is, of course, for some reason you didn't feel like doing it, so you defer it, you delay doing it, you said, well, I'll do it tomorrow. That's the real reason, right? You didn't want to do it. Of course, if you had wanted to do it, you would have done it. And of course, not having enough time is just another reason, right? There are very few things when there is total equality, but there's absolute total equality when it comes to time. No one, no one gets more than 24 hours a day, or less. Now, exactly 24 hours every day. So when we say we don't have the time, that tends to be another reason for not doing it. Not doing it. People have all kinds of reasons. We have reasons that we are too young to do a thing, or we can have reasons we are too old, or we have reasons we are not ready, or we have reasons that maybe tomorrow, or reasons that um, the timing isn't right, and the reasons going go on and on and on. It is okay to do it as long as you know and do it deliberately. As long as you know that that is not true, you can do it. Be my guest and use it. As long as you know that it's not accurate, that it is just another sky is blue. Now what happens when you start doing that is you're going to sort of find yourself a little funny, you know, because you say, nah, I don't want to do it, that's why. You're going to be honest about it. And that's fine, you see. I don't want to go out tonight and meet with these people and party. I just don't want to do it. So you don't just say, I'm sort of tired, and, but I don't know, I might make it, but don't really count them. You know how we go through a whole routine like that? And you say, hey, you know, I'm not going to be there tonight. I have other plans. Even if the other plan is to, to collapse on the couch. <laughs> that's a plan, isn't it? You don't have to lie about it. But when you kick yourself like that and other people, then again, you set up brain patterns that you don't really want to deal with. And people already do enough self-sabotage as it is without doing any additional things like that. So one way would be to be more honest with ourselves. And I know that's not easy. It is simple, but not easy. It's not easy to do that, but it will help. I can promise you that, that it will really help in order to get off the excuse wagon and deal with it in a more direct fashion. When you stop to think about it, you'll find all kinds of negative self-commands people give themselves all day long. You, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, let's have some examples of things that people say, and when you take them literally, they're very negative. You'll give me a pain. That's a real pain. Yeah. People use that one a lot, right? People say, that's a pain in the neck. Or it's a pain in the back. Or a little lower. <laughs> lower back. And then people, if you repeat this often enough, with enough emphasis, the brain believes it and will do whatever it can. So the brain, in essence, works like this, right? So a person says, you know, this is a real pain. This is a real pain. This is a real pain. Eventually, the brain gets it and says, Oh, I see. You want a pain. Is that it? And you say, yes, it's a real pain. And the brain says, all right, one pain coming up. <laughs> like a good short order cook, you know, one pain coming up. <coughs> what else? Uh, somebody else had sick another one. Tired. I'm sick and tired. Sick and tired of this or that. Oh, yeah. I'm sick and tired. This is a double shot. <laughs> not just sick, <laughs> not just tired, but sick and tired. I have a son, and when he was about five years old, he came home one day and told me that exact phrase. I asked him to clean up some stuff he had on the floor, and he stood up and he said to me, five years old, okay, he says to me, I'm sick and tired of cleaning up my stuff. <laughs> so, I'm sort of taken aback, a five-year-old child saying that. And so I look him in the eye and I say to him, Eric, um, I'm sorry to hear that. And he looks at me, he doesn't know what is happening here. I said, where does it hurt? And he says, what are you talking about? I said, well, I thought that you said you were sick. Do you, your stomach feel a little queasy? Do you have a headache? Or in what way do you feel sick? And he says, well, I'm okay. I said, oh, all right. Now, I did hear you say that you were tired. Now, I have a wonderful remedy for that. You go to bed early. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to go to bed early. 
I said, oh, well, you're not tired. He says, no, I have lots of energy. Look at me. And he jumps up and down in front of me to show how much energy he had. So I said, let me see if I have this clear now. You are not sick because you say you're fine, and you're also not tired, right? He says, yeah, that's right. I said, well, why on earth would you tell me that you're sick and tired then? He said, well, I don't know. And he went on and disappeared. He has never said it again. And I don't blame him. If somebody would nail me like that, I wouldn't say it again either, you know? <laughs> but he heard that somewhere in the school, or one of the adults or another kid say it, and it has a nice little oomph to it, so it sounded good to him. So he said, hey, I'm going to do it that way, and he kept on repeating that. And if I didn't know anything about this material, I would not have said anything, because the parent doesn't pay too much attention to it if you don't know that that might be damaging. And that might have become one of his pet favorite phrases because he really liked the sound of that. Yeah, what else do people say? You give me an energy. Oh, isn't that a wonderful one here? First of all, when we say that another person is doing it to us, it makes us the victim, right? So, first of all, we are playing victim. And... Playing victim means that we're walking around with a big sign on our behind saying, please kick here. <laughs> and let me assure you, if you were to do that, you're going to find people are going to oblige you. So we don't want to play victim because if you are a victim, it means you have no control. And we are teaching the exact opposite. We're talking about self, mind control. So saying you give me a headache is a ludicrous statement to begin with. The other person cannot give you a headache unless they were actually were taking a hammer and pounding on your head. And since they're not doing that, when a person says that, what they're really saying is, I am responding to you in such a way that I'm creating a headache for myself. That's the truth. And if you're doing it in that fashion, by all means, go ahead and do it. Create your headache if you wish. So it's not a true statement. You're lying when you say it. Nobody gets you angry. Nobody gets you upset. Nobody gives you a headache. No one does that. Now, I grant you that somebody might be very nasty. Please, yes, I can totally appreciate the fact. But it is your response to whatever happens to you that determines how you're going to feel about it. You have a choice to respond and become angry, or you have a choice not to. It's up to you. And if you choose to respond in a negative way, then fine, so be it, but it is your choice. The other person has nothing to do with it. All right? What else do people say? What about like, uh, like the media? You see um, cold remedy commercials and mm -hmm. somebody, this poor sucker is miserable. And oh, yeah. Tested, you know? Oh, yeah. Remember this one? The cold and flu season is here. Oh, yeah, right. Get it. <laughs> oh, my God, I better go out and buy some, right? Yeah. Of course it is programming. If you accept that, sure, if you accept that it is time to catch a cold, it is very easy to oblige because the brain is very powerful, right? The brain says, oh, sure, hey, you want one? Let's go and find one because you have to catch one, right? Mm, yeah, this one is mine. This one has my name on it. It's very easy to do so, and there's a lot of programming statements that we have learned. Maybe your mom or dad said to you, don't wear wet socks. Because if you wear wet socks, you're going to catch a cold. Anyone there? Or if you go, you know, don't go outside with wet hair. You're going to catch a cold. I wonder what all the people do at the beaches who swim in the ocean and are sitting out with wet hair. How come they don't catch colds? Well, you see, in the ocean, it doesn't count. It only counts in the street, not in the ocean. What else do people say? I bet that's impossible. The word impossible is another one. When you talk about you and say, well, I, I, I think that's impossible for me. Be very careful with that, because you'll find that very few things are impossible. It is usually a time frame word. It used to be impossible to go to the moon till it was done in 1969, right? All of a sudden it became possible. It is impossible for the bumblebee to fly because the wingspan is too short for the body weight. It's true. You, and every, you know, someone, I don't know whether this is true or not, somebody told me up that they had this up on an engineering department, on a blow-up, in the Boeing company, 
And they have that. They have a picture of a bumblebee, and it says underneath, it is impossible to fly for the bumblebee because the wingspan is too short for the body weight. And from a mechanical engineering point of view, with our current knowledge, that's an absolute true fact. Of course, the bumblebee doesn't know this, so it just goes <laughs> and flies. <laughs> yeah, but it's doing something impossible to our current knowledge. And maybe you're still using some impossibles for you that were impossible for you when you were four. But not now that you are 24, 44, 84. Right? We have this old belief system yet. How about people who drop something, then they start probing themselves and say, I'm clumsy. Look at how clumsy I am. Boy, am I clumsy. After a while, we will become that way, will we not? We'll be right. You and I always get to be right. Isn't this wonderful? You always get to be right, because whatever you say is true for you. If you repeat it often enough, make strong enough impressions on the brain, it will become true. Have you ever had someone say this to you? Um, I've been worrying about it a lot, and it finally happened. <laughs> yeah. How about people who say things like, uh, to go back to uh, the physical level again, that burns me up. Well, fever will take care of that, right? <laughs> I cannot stand that. Maybe problem with the back or the feet. Uh, I remember uh, I took my car in for a repair some years ago, and the man who was handling the paperwork said to me, he said, I'll have this guy take care of it for you. He said, hey, stupid, come over here. I said, uh, I'd like a different mechanic, please. <laughs> Because even if my man by a wonderful man, if he'd been programmed to be stupid, I surely didn't want to work him on my car. And of course, very negative. And a lot of negativity gets done to children. And it is done not in any knowing way. I want you to appreciate that. It's not done deliberately that people do not know. But if you say to a child, you never amount to anything, in anger, for instance, that obviously is not very pleasant advice. That is a very negative program that's going on. And when you say to a child who has never done this particular thing before, when they don't do it right the first time, oh, you'll never learn how to do that right, then, of course, again, that is very negative programming. And an extreme example of, of that uh, are people that still have problems with what they were told when they were three, four, five years old, 20, 30, 40 years later. It is still in there and they're having to deal with it and they go into therapy and what have you because of statements like that. Now, fortunately, the ones that you really want to pay attention to are the ones you repeat a lot. It isn't the ones that you say once in a while. It is the ones that are repeated all the time. The repetition is what does it. Does it. Does it. The word kill. It's a very negative word as well. This job is killing me. We used this as an example early, earlier. These kids are killing me. A mom, frustrated and tired, might say, right? These kids are killing me. Cancer runs in the family. Oh, yeah, negative programming pertaining to health. This is another problem. Cancer runs in the family, the example here, yes? We talked about we don't remember much in the first two, three, four years of our lives, but that is when a lot of programming takes place. In other words, here is this two-year-old at a family get-together. And usually a family get-together, sooner or later, people start giving war stories. By war stories, I mean what happened to them, sickness and illness-wise, and scars. Let me see, you think that is a bad scar, somebody might say. Let me show you my scar. It runs around on the side in a circle and makes an arrow to the left over here. Now, that is a scar. <laughs> And, of course, negative things like uh, heart problems run in the family, cancer runs in the family. That, that is highly negative because, again, three years old now, judgment faculties are not fully developed. You're three years old and you hear that something runs in the family. Do you belong to this family? Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> there's only one way to prove that. A lot of programming is on because of old, false belief systems that are perpetuated from generation to generation. There are, of course, thousands of words and phrases we unknowingly use that are negative self-programming statements. 
The word can't is a very negative word, for instance. People say such things as, I can't take it anymore. I can't handle it. I can't remember names. And the word die is also used very indiscriminately, such as, I'm dying of thirst. I'm dying to get there. I'm dying to see her. When it comes to money, there are all kinds of negative statements, such as, Money is the root of all evil. Money burns a hole in my pocket. I never have any money left over at the end of the month. Or, I can't afford the things I want. It seems like I'm always broke. People don't want to pay me what I'm worth. I'm unlucky with money. When it comes to being overweight, there's a whole array of self-programming statements that people use, such as, No matter what I do, I can't seem to lose weight. Everything I eat goes right to my hips. I lose weight, but then I regain it all back. All I have to do is look at food and I gain weight. Now that you are more attuned to how these destructive statements you have innocently been using may affect you, you will start discovering that there are many statements and pet phrases that, when taken literally, can be extremely damaging. What can you do to identify and eliminate these negative thoughts? Well, in Silva we say, when you catch yourself thinking or saying negative things, or when other people are giving you negative information or input, do something very simple. Say this one word twice. Cancel, cancel. See how simple it is? Just those two words. Cancel, cancel. These words will be a cue to your brain that you are no longer accepting this negative feedback. Practice this. You need to practice till the old pattern has changed. Let's suppose you have to do a particular task and you look at the clock and you say to yourself, I'm never going to get that done on time. The first thing you do is say the words, cancel, cancel, out loud or in your mind. The second thing you do is to replace the negative statement with a positive one. You can say something like, I have plenty of time to get the work done. Now let's check in again with the class where we discuss negative versus positive approaches. We're talking about negative programming and a lady about five, six years ago stood up in class and she says to me, Well, but what if it's true? I said, what do you mean? She says, I hate my ex-husband's guts. <laughs> I said, all right, let's examine it. For how long have you been divorced? She says, a little over 10 years. All right. And for 10 years long, you've been saying that you hate your ex-husband, right? She says, yep, it's true. So, okay, it's true. I believe you. I said, how is he holding up under all this negativity? And she said, well, he doesn't care at all. He just goes around and has a wonderful time in life. I said, oh, I see. And how are you holding up? And she said, well, I'm having a real tough time. When a person sends out, this is what takes place. I'm going to draw a stick figure here. One person and he is another person. So we're going to called person A and person B. Took me years to learn to draw like this. <laughs> so person A, this lady is an example here, is sending out this negative thought to her ex-husband, right? I hate your guts. That's pretty negative, I would say. What she did not understand was that there are mental laws at work. There are mental laws just as there are physical laws. In other words, we're all familiar with the law of gravity. Somebody goes to the top of a high building and jumps off, what's going to happen to them? They go down. The law of gravity is in effect. Now, what's so interesting about laws is that the law functions whether one believes in it or not. In other words, somebody who goes to the top of a building and jumps off and says, I do not believe in the law of gravity, as they're jumping off, <laughs> what's going to happen to them? They're still going to go down and break some bones, right? Because it doesn't make any difference. The law just is. Now, anyone ever work in an office of some kind? Yeah? Okay. 
This is what I call the office principle. And that is, before a letter or memo or anything gets sent out from an office, they always keep a copy for the file, right? In case somebody calls then and said, hey, reference to your letter and so on. Now, when you send out thoughts to someone, you always keep a copy for the file. As a matter of fact, the copy goes into the file before the letter gets sent out, right? Yes. So this lady is saying, I hate my ex-husband. The first thing that this person is doing is sending a copy of that to themselves. Now, it doesn't say in the copy, I hate his guts. She says, I hate my guts, is what it says in the copy. So she is sending a message to herself of self-hatred. Now, she is sending out this message of hatred to this other person, in this case, her ex-husband. The ex-husband says, no thanks, I'm not buying today. What happens? The other person is not interested in accepting this negative thought. What happens? It goes back to the sender, doesn't it? Yep. Here it goes. Another one. We have now two messages saying, I hate my guts. Guess what happens to somebody when you do that for about 10 years? No wonder she was so miserable. So I told her the very best advice I can give you is to first stop doing it. Step number one is to stop doing that. You know, it's a little bit like that old joke. You know, man goes to a doctor and has his arm really twisted around his neck like that and says, Doctor, when I do this, it really hurts. And the doctor says, Stop doing it. <laughs> What's the point in doing that? Okay, the second thing is to change that pattern. Okay, the first step is to become aware that you're doing it. You can only change something once you become aware of it. So become aware of the fact that you're doing it, and then that's A. B is to stop doing it, and then C is to change the pattern. So see, you're trying to tell me I should think of my husband as in a loving way? I said, if you could, it would be wonderful. She said, but I don't think that's possible. I said, all right, start off with neutrality then. <laughs> you can work your way up, but start with neutralizing that. How do you neutralize it? You cancel it out. You cancel out the feelings of hatred. Then if you're up to it, you can then work on positive feelings, but at least it is, at this point, canceled out. What is so nice about it, it works both ways. Let's use an example. You have a friend of yours, your friend is a little down, a little depressed, and so you want to send loving thoughts to your friend. Can you do that? Sure you can. You send nice, loving thoughts, pink hearts, or whatever you're sending. What's the first thing that's going to happen when you send out positive thoughts? That loving thought goes to you. Sending, I love me. There's nothing wrong in saying that. We can all use that one. Now you're sending a positive thought to your friend. Will your friend say, oh, gee, thanks a lot, and take it? Sure. Maybe yes, maybe no. But maybe your friend responds in saying, I don't want your loving thoughts. I want to be miserable a little while longer. <laughs> Try me next week. So this person is rejecting. Keep in mind, every person has the power and the ability to accept or reject. Even though logically you says they ought to, they don't have to. So this person might reject your loving thoughts. Either way, you win. This is win-win. If they accept, you win. If they don't accept, you win. It just goes back to you. So it's a win-win situation. So put this into practice. And you'll find that some very nice, positive things will happen in your life. I highly recommend that you use this with people that you don't like too well. The people you already like a lot, you're already doing it. It's the people that you don't like a lot. Silver graduate told me a story. She had a neighbor of hers. And her neighbor knew that the pharmacist which they were going to was a friend of hers. So the neighbor complained to the silver grad. Instead of going directly to the pharmacist and complain about the service, she went to the neighbor and she figured the neighbor will tell her that way I don't have to face the pharmacist, you know? So she bitterly complained. She says, this guy doesn't even look at me when I come in to get my prescription filled. He doesn't greet me. He's been doing this for 10 years. He doesn't even know my name. He doesn't even know who I am. He treats me like I'm a total stranger. As a matter of fact, he doesn't say anything. He treats me horribly. 
And it, the only reason that I'm not leaving and going elsewhere is because the next pharmacist is so far away from me, I would take a lot of extra traveling time. But I want you to go and tell your friend how nasty he is to people and that he's losing a lot of business in being that way. Maybe he'll shape up. So the silver guest says, all right, I'll see what I can do for you. A week later, the neighbor stops by and says to the silver grad, wow, you really must chew them out good because this guy is wonderful. I can't believe it, the total transformation. I came in and he gave me a big smile and he greeted me by name and he said, I tell you what, I normally tell you, come back in 20 minutes, I want you to stay right here, I'm going to do yours right now so that you don't have to wait. She says, he treated me like a queen. Boy, whatever you said to him, boy, it worked wonders. You really must have laid into him. And she says, what did you tell him? And the silver grad says, well, this is what I said to him. I told him that you thought that he was the best pharmacist that you had ever done business with in your 65 years of doing business with pharmacists. That he was a warm, caring individual, that you loved the way he took care of you, and that you were going to recommend him to everybody you knew as a wonderful person to go and do business with. <laughs> I want you to be the pharmacist for one second and have somebody come to you and say, this person raves about you, thinks you're wonderful. You say, oh, let me go through the files. Who is this person? What's her name? Oh, yeah. They are, oh, I know who that is. She gets in that van. Wow. You have your mental flag out from that lady comes in. You're going to let her know how much you appreciate her, right? Just the opposite of what she expected. There was no chewing out at all. Not one negative comment was made to this man. Just purely positive, and it works like a charm. And you know something? Everybody responds to that. Everybody responds to that. You and I and all human beings respond to getting positive feedback about ourselves. I don't know anybody who enjoys being put down. And I don't know anyone who does not enjoy being praised. So what you want to do is praise, praise, praise. You have people, they do something wrong, they do something right, ignore what they're doing wrong and praise what they're doing right. That's how they train animals, you know. <laughs> they do. <laughs> if it works for the animals, maybe it will work on the humans. <laughs> it's true. Now, if you take a good animal trainer, there will be no whips, no nothing. Good animal trainers will train by ignoring what the animal is doing wrong and giving positive feedback, usually in the form of food, for doing something right. And after a while, the animal stops doing things wrong because there is no positive feedback. So put these little things into practice. Let me offer another way to maintain a positive outlook. The question that you hear most often when you meet people is, how is it going? How are you doing? And in silver, we use an answer to that question that will help both you as well as your listener. We respond to that question by saying, I'm doing better and better. Thanks. How are you? The key words here are better and better, which actually is a shortcut version of one of the positive phrases that we teach. The positive phrase in its totality goes... Every day, in every way, I am getting better, better, and better. This is one of the positive phrases that is used in the next exercise, where you are again going to explore the alpha dimension. We will begin this exercise by asking you to assume a comfortable sitting position. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. And go deeper. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from ten to one. On each descending number, you will feel yourself going deeper, and you will enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. Ten, nine, feel going deeper. Eight, seven, six, deeper and deeper. Five, four, three, deeper and deeper. Two, one.
you are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. You may enter a deeper, healthier level of mind by simply relaxing your eyelids. Relax your eyelids. Feel how relaxed they are. Allow this feeling of relaxation to flow slowly downward throughout your body, all the way down to your toes. It's a wonderful feeling to be deeply relaxed, a very healthy state of being. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from one to three. At that moment, you will project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation. I will then stop talking to you, and when you next hear my voice, one hour of time will have elapsed at this level of mind. My voice will not startle you. You will take a deep breath, relax, and go deeper. One. Two. Three. Project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation until you hear my voice again. Relax. Relax. Take a deep breath and go deeper. You will continue to listen to my voice. You will continue to follow the instructions at this level of the mind and any other level, including the outer conscious level. This is for your benefit. You desire it, and it is so. Whenever you mentally or verbally mention the word relax, all unnecessary movements and activities of your body, brain, and mind will cease immediately, and you will become completely passive and relaxed physically and mentally. I may bring you out of this level or a deeper level than this by counting to you from one to five. At a count of five, your eyes will open. You will be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health. The difference between genius mentality and lay mentality is that geniuses use more of their minds and use them in a special manner. You are now learning to use more of your mind and to use it in a special manner. The following are beneficial statements that you may occasionally repeat while at these levels of mind. Repeat mentally after me. My increasing mental faculties are for serving humanity better. Every day, in every way, I am getting better, better, and better. Positive thoughts bring me benefits and advantages I desire. The next silver mind control exercise will include the alpha sound that will help you to relax physically and mentally so that you may enter deeper, healthier levels of mind. Every time you function at these levels of the mind, you will receive beneficial effects physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help yourself physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help your loved ones, physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help any human being who needs help, physically and mentally. You will never use these levels of the mind to harm any human being. If this be your intention, you will not be able to function within these levels of the mind. You will always use these levels of the mind in a constructive, creative manner.
In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At that moment, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You will have no ill effects whatsoever in your head, no headache. No ill effects whatsoever in your hearing, no buzzing in your ears. No ill effects whatsoever in your vision and eyesight. Vision, eyesight, and hearing improve every time you function at these levels of mind. One, two, coming out slowly now. Three, at the count of five, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Feeling the way you feel when you have slept the right amount of revitalizing, refreshing, relaxing, healthy sleep. Four, five. Eyes open, wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. In learning to reprogram yourself for success and a healthy, positive outlook, it is very important to understand that how you perceive things affects both your attitude and behavior. I'm going to tell you another story. There was a farmer who had a small plot of land, and if he worked day and night with his horse, his one old horse, if he worked day and night from sunup to sundown, seven days a week, every week, no holidays, no vacations, there would be just enough food to feed him and his family. One day, disaster strikes. The horse ran away. One of the neighbors hears about this and says, Oh my God, your horse ran away? That's horrible. And the farmer says, No, it isn't. And the neighbor says, What do you mean? I know what this means. I'm just like you, you know. If you have to do this by hand instead of using the horse, there is no way in the world you can do it. You're going to run out of time. You'll get less food. There will be not enough food for your family. You're slowly going to starve to death. That is horrible. Farmer says, No, it isn't. All right, the neighbor says, Why isn't this not horrible? Tell me, explain to me, I don't understand. And the farmer says, what you don't know is it's true the horse ran away, but it came back. And not only did it come back, it brought two other horses with it. I got three of them now. And the neighbor says, wow, that's wonderful. And the farmer says, no, it isn't. So the neighbor says, what do you mean? You got three horses, you, it will be easier, you have a little extra time, more food, more leisure. It's wonderful. Farmer says, no, it isn't. So, okay, the neighbor says, why is it not wonderful that you have extra horses? He says, well, what you don't know is that my oldest son tried to tame one of these wild horses and got thrown off and broke both of his legs. And the neighbor said, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> and the farmer said, no, no it isn't. No, it isn't. <laughs> Why isn't that? And the reason it isn't, the farmer said, because the militia came by, recruited all the young, able-bodied men, <laughs> and skipped my son because he had two broken legs. This is a never-ending story, by the way. <laughs> you can go on and on like that and go back and forth, back and forth. And the reason I'm even mentioning it to you is that since you do not know ahead of time, it is usually only in retrospect when we find out what was wonderful or what was not so wonderful, you might as well go ahead and assume everything is there for a reason. And it's going to work out the right way, because if you base your actions on that assumption and get rid of the fear-based emotions, you'll find it tends to be a lot more wonderful than not so. So use the positive approach. Okay, when you do mental programming, there are a number of factors involved that will make your programming more or less effective depending on how well you use the factors involved. Number one reason is desire. When I say, or you say, that we want something, 
do we really want it? Or are we just talking about it? Or is it maybe a mere wish? All right, I'm going to tell you one more story about desire. A young man walks into a monastery, asks to speak to the wise person that's running the monastery, gets in, and is being questioned why he is there. Because the head monk is telling him, he says, look, we get people here towards the end of their life who want to spend their last five years or ten years of their life meditating, getting closer to God. You're a young man, you're about 21 years old. You understand what you're saying is that you want to spend the rest of your life in this monastery? And the young man says, yes, I do. So the old man says, well, this is a very serious choice you're making here. We need to discuss this in more detail. Why don't we go outside? There's a little lake outside and there's a little rowboat. Do you know how to swim? And the young man says, no, I don't know how to swim. He says, fine, do you know how to row a boat? The young man says, yep, I know how to row a boat. He says, good, let's go to the middle of the lake where it's very peaceful and quiet, and we can discuss that. So they're sitting in the boat, they get to the middle, put down the oars. The old man is asking the young man some questions about his background, where he's from, what he has experienced so far in life. And right in the middle of one of the answers, without any indication that anything is about to happen, the old man picks up the young man and throws him overboard. Now, since the young man doesn't know how to swim, he, of course, starts to drown. He starts to go under and gets back up in the water and comes up for air and starts to go down again and is struggling frantically, gets back up to get some more air in his lungs. And this goes on for a little while till he starts to lose his strength and he's about to start floating away. And the old man picks him up halfway out of the water, allows him a couple of deep breaths, and as he is finishing his second deep breath, he dumps him again. I'm telling you, they're tough in the East. They're <laughs> tough. Dumps him right again. He goes through the same process again, and one more time, he's about to go, he lifts him up again, allows him a couple of deep breaths, and dumps him again. Third time, this young man is, of course, getting weaker as you go along. He is using all his physical energy trying to stay afloat. This is it for him. You know, he's about to go, and the old man picks him up and puts him back in the boat. And he says to the young man, let's row to the shore now. And the young man has never rode this fast in his life. He wants to get away from this crazy old man as fast as he can, of course. You know? So he is rowing with whatever energy he has left. He rows to the shore, jumps out of the boat, and stands back and, and looks at this old man with, you know, questioning, why on earth would you do this to me? And the old man says, let me explain to you why I did that. I have a question for you. What were you thinking of when you were down in the water? And the young man said, what was I thinking of? What do you mean, as was I thinking of? He says, when you were down under the water, what were you thinking about? And the young man said, what do you mean? I was thinking about getting breath. Don't you understand? I don't know how to swim. I'm drowning. I want to get breath in my head so I can stay alive a few seconds longer. I'm a young man. I'm 21 years old. I want to live. I don't want to die. He says, were you thinking of anything else? Were you thinking of maybe having a good time, playing with your friends? The young man says, no. He says, were you thinking maybe taking a nice ride on a horse and having some fun that way? He says, no, master. All I wanted to do was to breathe. Please, that's all I want. There's nothing else. I had no thoughts of anything except breath. The old man looked at him. He says, ah, good. He says, when you feel the same way about becoming enlightened and studying here in this monastery, as you did about breath a little while ago, you can come back here any time. And stay here. He says, why don't you meditate on this for a while and see me and let me know what you wish to do. About 30 minutes later, young man walks back in. He says, thank you very much, master. Maybe I'll see you in 40 years. <laughs> That's not what he wanted, obviously. He was just trying to run away from his problems temporarily, hoping they would go away, you know, for a while. <coughs> He didn't really want to spend his rest of his life there. He did not have a strong desire to do that at all. There was no desire there. It was maybe a mere wish or maybe an escape valve, not a desire. So the first thing you want to do about the things that you say that you want is check out your desire factor. Do you really want this? Or are you maybe saying you want it? Is it maybe old programming? Did somebody else tell you this should be good for you? 
or would be good for you. Check, is this your desire? If it is, fine. Then you're done with that particular element. Yes, I really want to do this or have this or become this or change this or whatever it is you're working on. Second factor is belief. What is your belief system in this area? Do you believe that you can? If you're weak on belief, you might want to do things such as, has anybody else ever done this? In other words, somebody might say, I want to write a book. Has anyone else ever written a book? Yes? Oh yes, hundreds of thousands of people. Well, if it is possible for the other hundreds of thousands of people, maybe it's possible for you. Okay? Okay? People say, I want to make X amount of dollars per year. Let's say, pick any number, let's say $60,000 a year. Has anyone else ever made $60,000 a year? Oh yeah, lots of people make $60,000 a year. If they can, you can. So your belief factor, do you believe you can? Are you weak in your belief? Then you want to shore it up, make it stronger. Think of it a little bit like a stool with three legs on it. You want to have sturdy legs on your stool if you want to use it. So desire would be one leg, believe would be another one. Do you believe you can? may want to cancel out some old false belief systems. Maybe you still have a belief system that says, I never have enough money in my life. I always run out of money by the end of the month. Ah, you see, if that is true, we are finding ourselves on this one. So you want to cancel out negative or false belief systems we have in that particular area and replace them with a positive. Cancel out the negativity and replace it with a positive. For instance, from now on in, instead of saying I'm always short of money, you might want to say I always have plenty of money in my life, as an example. You know, the phrase that you come up personally is the best one for you. Anything like that to indicate that what your belief system was at one time is no longer true. People sometimes say money burns a hole in my pocket. Okay, indicating again that it's not enough. You want to have everything go in the same direction. So at the one hand, you don't want to be programming for money. At the other hand, committing self-sabotage, you're saying, but I never have enough. You see, then there is a conflict, and when there's a conflict, nothing happens. Things stay as they were. So we want to deal with it on two different levels. Increase your belief by creating a positive belief system instead of a negative belief system, if there is negativity to be found. Now, how about someone who says they want to earn $60,000 a year to stay with that example, but believe they're only worth 30? They would be far better off to first go from, let's suppose they're earning 20 today, they would be better off to first go from 20 to 30, and then maybe go from 30 to 45, and then go from 45 to 60. Because they will then work within their belief system. And it is a lot easier if you work in your belief system than when you work outside of it. It makes it much more difficult. So, you need to be honest with yourself on this one. You need to be brutally honest with you. You have to work within your belief system. Can you not stretch it a little bit? Oh, sure you could. But uh, let me tell you, if someone goes from 20 to 30, it will be a lot easier to believe they can earn 45 or 60 than someone who does not believe they're worth more than 20. So the closer you get, you'll find the easier it is to believe. So in that particular case, you would take it incremental and do it step by step to get and continue to work within your belief system. The third factor is expectation. This is a little more subtle. Once you do a mental program to expect what you program for to manifest itself, to come about. It's a little different from belief. It is more in the sense of um, when you come home at night and the light is off, and you want to turn the lights on, you flip the switch. 
when you flip the switch, what do you expect to happen? The light to go on. Do you stand at the light switch and agonize? <laughs> do you stand there and say to yourself, I wonder if it's going to work or not? Maybe I ought not to flip the switch, because that way I'm not going to get hurt if it doesn't work. Maybe I ought to light a candle instead, because I know that one will work. You don't do any of these things, do you? You fully expect the light to go on when you flip the switch. There is no fear, there is no hesitation, you just do it. So, do you expect to get what you are programming for? The higher the expectation, the quicker it will happen. So, the three legs are desire, belief, and expectancy. You're strong in all three areas. You'll find mental programming at alpha will work rapidly. If you're a little weaker in some of the areas, it might take you a little longer. So that's the difference between people say, how come it took me you know, three weeks, or three days, or three months? The time element tends to be correlated to the three factors involved. Desire, believe, and expectancy. The stronger, the faster it will work. So if there's any area where you need some shoring up, then that is what you want to do. Increase your desire. How do you increase your desire, for instance? Go over the benefits. What are the benefits? What is in it for you if you were to do this, or have it, or be it, or become it? What are the benefits? So you might want to make a list for yourself of the benefits to be derived. When you review your benefits, the odds are your desire will increase. Of course, that is the whole reason that you want to do this to begin with. If you're weak in the belief system that you can do it, review your previous successes in other areas. Because when you review your previous successes in other areas, you believe that you can do this in this new area will increase because you just went over all the areas that you already were successful in. Expectation is at the beta level of the brain, while at the alpha level of the brain, we accept it as already being true and real. So we expect at beta and we accept at alpha. This is not going to happen the very first time you do this, because there will be not enough expectation because of previous results. But as you keep on using these tools, your expectation will become stronger and stronger. And you basically want to operate in this fashion. You want to sort of call in your order mentally, just like you would do to a catalog company. Right? If you call a company by phone with an 800 number with a charge card, you basically Say, here's the information, send me whatever it is you're ordering. Do you have expectation that it's going to show up at your door? Oh, sure, right? Sure. You call, if you were to call a big company, like Sears, for instance, and say, uh, can you send me a tape recorder? And they say, sure, uh, which one do you want, model number, such and such. Yeah, we have that in stock, you ought to get it within the next two to three weeks. Are you going to call every day to make sure that you're getting it? You're going to call the company every day and say, by the way, I yesterday ordered this uh, tape recorder. You're sure you're going to send this to me? Are you going to do that every day? I hope you're not, because uh, these people answering the phone there are going to be very unhappy with you if you were to do that. They say, well, we told you we're going to ship it to you. Yeah, it will be there. Just relax. Right? So normally, of course, you would not. You fully expect this thing to show up, don't you? Yeah, you say, all right, so it should be at two or three weeks. Now, if it were not to show up in three or four weeks, then, of course, you would want to double check what was going on. But in the meantime, in between time, you would have full expectation for this to show up at your doorstep. So desire, belief, and expectancy are the key elements in any kind of mental programming. Use those three. Now you are about to hear the alpha sound. The alpha sound is designed to help you reach and maintain the alpha level while you are entering deeper physical and mental relaxation. 
simply listening to it with your eyes closed, resting in a comfortable position, will help keep you centered. And the more centered and relaxed you feel, the more effectively and efficiently you'll be able to function at beta as you carry on any activity in your life. You can lead yourself through a guided meditation, like the mental vacation you took on the first tape. You may also use this time at Alpha to visualize your goals. If you choose to do this, remember to create images of your goals in your mind as if you've already accomplished them. My recommendation for the most effective way to use this alpha sound is to listen to it daily, preferably in the morning after you awaken or at night before going to bed. So make yourself comfortable, close your eyes, and relax.
This next exercise, called the long relaxation exercise, is designed for deep physical and mental relaxation, to strengthen your immune system, and to focus and center your awareness for better health, happiness, and success. I recommend that you listen to this exercise at least once every three days. This mind training exercise is adapted from one originally copyrighted by Jose Silva of Laredo, Texas, in 1969, after 25 years of research. New material on this presentation is copyright 1988 by Jose Silva. Reproduction for redistribution is strictly prohibited. This is the standard mind training exercise of the Silva method. In the background, you will hear the gentle tapping of the alpha sound. This sound will help your brain adjust to the alpha rhythm. Remember that if at any time you feel uncomfortable, readjust your position to make yourself more comfortable. If you feel you must open your eyes for any reason, then open your eyes and make yourself comfortable. Any time you desire to relax, mentally or verbally repeat the word relax, and you will relax physically and mentally. Now prepare for this mind training exercise by finding a comfortable sitting position. We will begin this exercise with a 3 to 1 method. Assume a comfortable position, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number 3 several times. Whenever you close your eyes to function at deeper levels of mind, Occasionally tell yourself mentally, if someone calls me, or in case of danger or an emergency, I will open my eyes immediately and be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health. To enter the physical relaxation level 3, mentally repeat and visualize the number 3 several times. And you are at level 3. Level 3 is for physical relaxation, to learn to relax from head to toes in a matter of seconds. To help you learn to physically relax at level 3, I'm going to direct your attention to different parts of your body. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your scalp, the skin that covers your head. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and completely relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will grow deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your forehead, the skin that covers your forehead. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and completely relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will grow deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your eyelids and the tissues surrounding your eyes. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and completely relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will grow deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your face, the skin covering your cheeks. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and completely relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head and place it in a deep state of relaxation 
that will grow deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate on the outer portion of your throat, the skin covering your throat area. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and completely relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your body and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will grow deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate within the throat area and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your body and place it in a deep state of relaxation going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your shoulders. Feel your clothing in contact with your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of the skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place your shoulders in a deep state of relaxation going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your chest. Feel your clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering your chest. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place your chest in a deep state of relaxation going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate within the chest area. Relax all organs. Relax all glands. Relax all tissues, including the cells themselves, and cause them to function in a rhythmic, healthy manner. Concentrate on your abdomen. Feel the clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering your abdomen. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place your abdomen in a deep state of relaxation going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate within the abdominal area. Relax all organs. Relax all glands. Relax all tissues, including the cells themselves, and cause them to function in a rhythmic, healthy manner. Concentrate on your thighs. Feel your clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering your thighs. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place your thighs in a deep state of relaxation, going deeper and deeper every time. Sense the vibrations at the bones within the thighs. By now, these vibrations should be easily detectable. Concentrate on your knees. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering the knees. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place your knees in a deep state of relaxation, going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your calves. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering the calves. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place these parts of your body in a deep state of relaxation, going deeper and deeper every time. To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on your toes. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on the soles of your feet. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. 
To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on the heels of your feet. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. Now cause your feet to feel as though they do not belong to your body. Feel your feet as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet feel as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet, ankles, calves and knees feel as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet, ankles, calves, knees, thighs, waist, shoulders, arms and hands feel as though they do not belong to your body. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. This is your physical relaxation level 3. Whenever you mentally repeat and visualize the number 3, your body will relax as completely as you are now, and more so every time you practice. To enter the mental relaxation level 2, mentally repeat and visualize the number 2 several times. And you are at level 2, a deeper level than 3. Level 2 is for mental relaxation, where noises will not distract you. Instead, noises will help you to relax mentally more and more. To help you learn to relax mentally at level 2, I'm going to call your attention to different passive scenes. Visualizing any scene that makes you tranquil and passive will help you relax mentally. Being at the beach on a nice summer day may be a tranquil and passive scene for you. A day out fishing may be a tranquil and passive scene for you. A tranquil and passive scene for you may be a walk through the woods on a beautiful summer day. There is a very blue sky with an occasional white cloud and a breeze that is blowing just right. There are beautiful wild flowers, tall shade trees, squirrels playing on the branches, birds are singing in the distance. Hear the birds singing in the distance. This is mental relaxation level 2, where noises will not distract you. To enhance mental relaxation at level 2, practice visualizing tranquil and passive scenes. To enter level 1, mentally repeat and visualize the number 1 several times. You are now at level 1, the basic plane level that you're learning to use for a purpose, any purpose you desire. To enter deeper, healthier levels of mind, practice with the countdown deepening exercises. To deepen, count downward from 25 to 1, or from 50 to 1, or from 100 to 1. When you reach the count of 1, you will have reached a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. You will always have full control and complete dominion over your faculties and senses at all levels of the mind, including the outer conscious levels. The best time to practice the countdown deepening exercises is in the morning when you wake up. Remain in bed for at least five minutes practicing the countdown deepening exercises. The second best time to practice is at night when you're ready to retire. 
the third best time to practice is at noon after lunch. Five minutes of practice is good, ten minutes is very good, and fifteen minutes is excellent. To practice once a day is good, two times a day is very good, and three times a day is excellent. If you have a health problem, practice for fifteen minutes three times a day. To come out of any level of the mind, count to yourself mentally from one to five, and tell yourself that at the count of five you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Then proceed to count slowly from one to two, then to three, and at the count of three, mentally remind yourself that at the count of five you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Proceed to count slowly to four, then to five, and at a count of five, and, with your eyes open, mentally tell yourself, I'm wide awake, feeling fine, and in perfect health, feeling better than before. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from ten to one. On every descending number, you'll feel yourself going deeper, and you'll enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. Ten, nine, feel going deeper. Eight, seven, six, deeper and deeper. Five, four, three, deeper and deeper. Two, one. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. You may enter a deeper, healthier level of mind by simply relaxing your eyelids. Relax your eyelids. Feel how relaxed they are. Allow this feeling of relaxation to flow slowly downward, throughout your body, all the way down to your toes. It is a wonderful feeling to be deeply relaxed, a very healthy state of being. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from one to three. At that moment, you will project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation. I will then stop talking to you, and when you next hear my voice, one hour of time will have elapsed at this level of mind. My voice will not startle you. You will take a deep breath, relax, and go deeper. One, two, three. Project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation until you hear my voice again. Relax. Relax. Take a deep breath and as you exhale, relax and go deeper. You will continue to listen to my voice. You will continue to follow the instructions at this level of the mind and any other level, including the outer conscious level. This is for your benefit. You desire it, and it is so. Whenever you mentally or verbally mention the word relax, all unnecessary movements and activities of your body, brain, and mind will cease immediately, and you will become completely passive and relaxed physically and mentally. I may bring you out of this level or a deeper level than this by counting to you from one to five. At the count of five, your eyes will open. You will be wide awake, feeling fine, and in perfect health. The difference between genius mentality and lay mentality is that geniuses use more of their minds and use them in a special manner. 
You are now learning to use more of your mind and to use it in a special manner. The following are beneficial statements that you may occasionally repeat while at these levels of mind. Repeat mentally after me. My increasing mental faculties are for serving humanity better. Every day, in every way, I am getting better, better and better. Positive thoughts bring me benefits and advantages I desire. I have full control and complete dominion over my sensing faculties at this level of the mind and any other level including the outer conscious level. And this is so. The following preventive statements are for your better health. Keep in mind that from now on I will occasionally be speaking in your place. I will never learn to develop, physically or mentally, mental disorders nor psychosomatic or functional ailments or diseases. Negative thoughts and negative suggestions have no influence over me at any level of the mind. I will always maintain a perfectly healthy body and mind. You have practiced entering deep, healthy levels of mind. In your next session, you will again enter level one and you will enter a deeper, healthier level of mind faster and easier than this time. Every time you function at these levels of the mind you will receive beneficial effects physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help yourself physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help your loved ones physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help any human being who needs help, physically and mentally. You will never use these levels of the mind to harm any human being. If this be your intention, you will not be able to function within these levels of the mind. You will always use these levels of the mind in a constructive, creative manner. And this is so. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At that moment, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You will have no ill effects whatsoever in your head, no headache. No ill effects whatsoever in your hearing, no buzzing in your ears. No ill effects whatsoever in your vision and eyesight. Vision, eyesight and hearing improved every time you function at these levels of mind. One, two, coming out slowly now. Three, at the count of five, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Feeling the way you feel when you have slept the right amount of revitalizing, refreshing, relaxing, healthy sleep. Four, five, eyes open, wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. This concludes the long relaxation exercise for the Silva Method. Let me finish with one last story. An old wise man lived up on a hill. The people from the neighboring villages would visit him for advice. Two young boys decided to challenge the old man's wisdom. They decided to have one of the boys stand before him with his hands behind his back, a bird cupped in those hands. They would ask him, Old man, what do I have in my hands? When the old man would answer a bird, 
The trick question would be, is it alive or is it dead? If the old man would say dead, they would show him the live bird. If the wise man would say alive, the boy would quickly wring the bird's neck and show him the dead bird. The next day, they went to visit the old wise man to see if their trick would work. Wise man, what do I have in my hands? One of the boys asked him, hiding his hands behind his back. It's a bird, the old man answered. That is true, wise man, but is it alive or is it dead? The wise man paused for a second, then looked the young boy straight in the eyes and said, That, young man, is entirely in your hands. Life's choices are in your hands. It is always entirely up to you. It is my desire for you to enjoy this program to its fullest and use it for continuing health, happiness and success. All right, let's start off with a couple of definitions. Let's start off with the definition for prosperity. This is actually from the Oxford English Dictionary, so it should be a good one. Mm-hmm. Prosperity is good fortune, success, well-being, the condition of thriving. And under abundance, it says, an overflowing condition, overflow, enough and more than enough, a plentifulness. And finally, under wealth, I happened, I wanted to look that one up to see if there were any common words here, and it's amazing because it basically says the same thing, the condition of being happy and prosperous, well-being, spiritual well-being, a blessing. So when we talk about being prosperous, what we're talking about is being prosperous and abundant in every area of life, not just money, even though money is very important, you want to be prosperous in every area of your life. There's no need or reason to feel or be limited. And if you feel that way, we're going to talk about how to change that. So we need balance in our lives. We need enough money, yes. And then we need enough love, yes. And we need plenty of health, don't we? Yes? Yes? yes. Yeah. Yeah. We want all of those goodies, right? Sure. You want to have one of, don't you want to have wonderful relationships? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wouldn't you like to have all the, the, the goodies in life without having to worry about uh, you know, paying bills at the end of the month? Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. yes. yes? Yeah, in other words, if you decide that you want to take a nice vacation and go for two or three weeks somewhere, let's say, uh, towards the end of the year, wouldn't it be nice if you say, all right, yeah, just pick the place and go without having to be concerned about, well, how am I going to pay for all of this? Yeah. yeah. Hawaii or other places that you may want to go to. So one of the things that is very crucial, I've been fortunate enough to have been working with people for the last 20 years, and one of the things that keeps on repeating itself over and over again is it's the belief systems that you have that make a huge difference in your life. Now, when people talk about prosperity, money tends to be the one, the first thing that people think of. And money, it is a fascinating subject because we have all these emotional things that are hooked up to money. And it usually starts very early in life. Um, when you were very little, I bet you somebody in your family said this to you. You were about, you were crawling your hands and knees, about a year and a half, something like that. And there's a coin. And you grab that coin. And what does a little child do? With anything that it gets its hands on, where does it go? To your mouth. And what did one adult say to you before you put it in your mouth? What did they say to you when they saw that? It's dirty. You don't know where it's been. Right? Don't put this in your mouth. Money is dirty. So guess what? At a year and a half, you already start forming a belief system that money is dirty. As a matter of fact, you have heard a term filthy rich, haven't you? Mm -hmm. And filthy lucre. Yeah, a filthy looker, you see. So already we have a term dealing that this is not good. You know, we don't want this. Nobody wants to have dirty stuff, right? Mm-hmm. 
So we are starting off very early like that. And of course, we also taught very early in life in limiting, in limits. There's only so much to go around. You know, when you go to the toy store, when you're a little kid, you want everything, right? Mm -hmm. So the parents, of course, who don't have enough money to buy you everything, or even if they do, they don't want to buy you everything. Of course, that's not very healthy for you to have, you know, buy 46 toys. <laughs> I remember one of my uh, uh, cousins was a, uh, has a little boy, and he was about three years old, and everybody in the family brought him toys for Christmas. So he looked at this whole stack of toys, there were maybe like 15 toys, and he's looking at that, and he doesn't know where to start. And he says, too much toys. Too much. It was too much. He got overloaded by 15 different toys that everybody had brought him. So the parents, of course, want to make you understand that this is not a good idea. So they say things like that. You say, well, why can't I have it? And what do the parents answer? What do they say? We can't afford it. We don't have enough money to buy you all of this. We can't afford it. Oh, okay. So you learn lessons along the way, right? And you learn also there's only so much to go around and you have to be taking care of your end because at the other end there may be a problem if you don't. Because another thing your parents told you when you did not want to eat all the food on your plate was what? Why, why were you supposed to eat all the food on your plate? Why? Starving children in India. <laughs> Starving children in India, China, you know, pick a country, right? Yeah. So, again, there's only so much. And if you don't eat it, you know, the, people, you're the poor little kids in China, India, or wherever, you know, are not going to get it. So, again, we are being taught lack all the time. This system, we believe in it because we hear it all the time. And we hear it, of course, in many other areas as well. We have this thought in our head, there's limited supply, there's limited supply, there's limited supply, there's limited supply. And if you want something, you have to take it away from somebody else. That's a horrible mindset, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because if you're a nice person, you don't want to take anything away from anybody else. So immediately, there's already a barrier here. If I want to make more money, it means somebody else has to make less. It's the false belief system. Now, this is nonsense. And intellectually, everybody agrees, well, this is nonsense. But deep inside, guess what? The belief system is that way. So you already set up a barrier for yourself. So we don't want to do that one. Maybe you've heard this one. You have to work very hard to earn money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the hardest working people that I know work in the fields. And they work from sunup to sundown, and they make very little money. You know, pick grapes, oranges, very little money. So if the definition of making money was to work hard, those people ought to be making the most money. Not true, is it? No. It's not true. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean you don't have to work hard at all? It depends. You may have to have a stretch. You have to work very hard. And then you may have a stretch where the money comes just sort of easily comes in without you having to work very hard for it. But working hard and earning money are not an equation. That is a false belief system. And of course, the most famous one, you have, everybody knows this one. Money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah? First of all, that is not a true quotation because the real quotation is the love of money is the root of all evil, which is something entirely different, of course. Okay? And uh, someone some years ago said, uh, poverty is the root of all evil. And I think that's probably a, a much more accurate quote. How about this one? You heard this one. When you wanted money from your parents when you were a kid, maybe like you were a teenager, you say, can I have uh, 50 bucks because I want to go to a concert? Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to give you 50 bucks. What do you think? Money grows on trees. Well, you see how well you're programmed? You see how well you know this stuff? Well, wait a second. Money, dollar bills, are made out of paper. Paper <laughs> comes from what? Trees. trees. So money does grow on trees. You see? It does. You can't take it with you. Well, that's true. But what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> it takes money to make money. Have you heard that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, there are many, many companies, including one that you may have heard of by the name of Microsoft, by Bill Gates, who started with $600. 
So how much money does it take? That's not necessary. There's never enough money. You know, if that is a belief system you have, again, there's a problem, right? Money burns a hole in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, you have that one? Okay. <laughs> Kim says, yeah, that's me. <laughs> if money burns a hole in your pocket, guess what happens up in here? You're going to run out of it real quick, right? Of course, it burns a hole in your pocket and disappears. I never have any money left at the end of the month. Ooh, guess what's going to happen? You're setting it up for the next month and the next month and the next month. Nobody wants to pay me what I'm worth. Poor me, you know. It seems like I'm always broke. <laughs> ah, yes. Oh, wow. I did not talk to you before we started, right? This is all just, okay, just to make sure that everybody knows. <laughs> I can't even balance my checkbook. <laughs> When I hit your number five times, you can yell bingo, okay? <laughs> And of course, TV programs us that all rich people are what? Crooks, right? <laughs> On TV, they're all bad guys. Right? So we have all this programming uh, going on. Uh, money doesn't buy happiness. Well, that's true, but It doesn't buy anything else either, right? I mean, money in itself. What is it? It's just a medium of exchange. There's nothing more, nothing less. You exchange your services in the form of dollar bills for somebody else's services in the form of dollar bills. Anything else that you add to that is the emotional stuff that you want to get rid of. All it is, it's neutral. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not anything. It is just a medium of exchange. That's all. You want to buy a new car, you have to work so many hours to work for it so that you can take your money and give it to the car dealer. So you exchange so many hours of work for so many hours of work to put a car together. It's nothing more and nothing less. And uh, the cleaner we are about the neutrality of money, the easier it is to get lots of it. So we want to get rid of all these emotional type hang-ups. And one way to do it in Silva, one of the things we teach is what I call a trigger word. And a trigger word is a word that you use that functions as a trigger. And a trigger word we use to get rid of negative belief systems is the word cancel. Let's try this out. Cancel, cancel. Yes. If you say that to yourself, whenever you start thinking about, oh, I don't have enough money, or uh, you have to work hard to have money, or money doesn't grow in trees, or I can't afford it, or any of those wonderful things that we have as belief systems, you want to cancel them out. You want to stop the thought by canceling it out. And then you want to replace it with a positive. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a few minutes. So basically, you know, the belief systems is the ones we want to change first because as long as we hang on to the old belief systems, nothing much is going to change in our lives, right? If we continue to believe that I'm always broke, well, how is this supposed to work? You know, the belief system is the one that attracts or repels all the time. It is like the lady was standing in front of me in a grocery store and we are getting to the register and she says uh, to the checker, give me a lottery ticket. And she turns to the person she was with. She says, I never win anything, you know. Uh. Well, why bother, you know? Yeah. Why bother? So we want to change our belief systems. You know, you want to cancel out any false beliefs, replace them with positive. Do just the opposite. Make it as positive as you can. If you've been saying, I always run out of money by the end of the month, you want to change it to saying, I always have plenty of money left by the end of the month. Even though, logically, you say, this is ridiculous, you know. Start thinking that way. Start saying that to yourself. Start changing the pattern. So cancel out the negativity, replace it with a positive. Another trigger word just to give you a few more is the word appreciate. In other words, if you want to have more money in your life, you're going to have to deal with people. Because people are the only ones that are going to give you any money. The dog next door is not going to give you a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> even if you have the last can of delicious dog food. So you have to interact with people. And you have to start to understand people better. And the way to do that, one of the easiest ways to understand people is to understand where they're coming from. And You and I and everybody else always wants to have the following thing. Everybody here wants to be appreciated. Mm -hmm. So you want to start off by appreciating people. So that would be a trigger word to yourself. When you start dealing, you're going to somewhere where you're going to meet people, 
The trigger word would be appreciate. I'm going to appreciate the people that are with. Somebody does something for you that they don't have to do, tell them you appreciate it. You see the whole person, their face will start glowing. They're acknowledged, you see. Think of everybody walking around with a big sign on their forehead that says, please appreciate me. <laughs> you know, if you mentally can do that, then you'll say automatically the right thing. And say thanks. People do things for you. Thank them for doing it. That's a trigger word. It opens up lines of communication when you talk to people. Another one, of course, is a very famous one. I'm sorry. You did something wrong. You screwed up. Hey, you're human. Say, yeah, I screwed up. I'm sorry. And all of a sudden, the people will relax, open up, and the communicate, lines of communications are open again. So what we want to do is to develop our personal prosperity power. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story from some time ago. In the Middle Ages, if you were a business person and you wanted to have a, a loan of money, you had to go to a money lender. And a money lender would loan you the money, and then, of course, you would have to pay it back. There was only a little catch there. If you did not pay it back, they would throw you behind in jail. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't where you, now you're getting a few phone calls, you know, from the bill collector. Uh-uh, not in the old days. You didn't pay, you go to jail. That was jail. This businessman was in trouble. He had loaned money. He had loaned more money and uh, didn't work out. So the money lender stopped by and said, hey, you know, you need to pay me off and I'm going to give you till the end of the month, but that's it. I've been waiting and waiting, been patient with you, but now it's time to pay up. Then you know what happens if you don't pay, go to jail. He says, stop by at my house by the end of the month. He says, and by the way, bring your daughter along. <laughs> Kim says, oh, I know where this story is going. <laughs> <laughs> so here... The businessman and his beautiful, lovely, young, sweet daughter, 19 years old, stop by at the moneylender's house. And the moneylender said to the businessman, well, you have the money for me? The businessman says, no, I need a little more time. He said, well, I'm sorry, can't give you any more time. He says, but I'll tell you what. If you let me marry your daughter, I will tear up the papers, we'll forget the whole thing, your family, you don't owe me a thing. Now, of course, this moneylender is ugly and old and mean and all of that, right, in order to make the story go. So they're talking to each other, the young woman and her father, and there's a well-known. So the moneylender sees that this is not going anywhere. He says, I tell you what, let's make this a 50-50 proposition. He says, I have an empty money bag here. He says, and what we'll do is, you see the little pebbles I have in the yard here, nice green pebbles, blue pebbles? What I'll do is uh, we'll take a green pebble and a blue pebble, put them in a money bag, And you, the young lady, gets to pick one of the pebbles. If you pick the green pebble, you're free to go. This is it. We'll tear up the papers, walk out of here. He says, however, if you pick the blue pebble, we'll still tear up the papers, but then she's going to have to marry me. So now the father and daughter huddle, and they say, what shall we do, what shall we do, what shall we do? And the young woman says, well, there are really no options. You would go to jail. In those days, a young woman would not work, so there was no way for her to make any money. So she said, let's go for it. The the odds are 50-50. So go to the moneylender, say to the moneylender, okay, let's do it. So the moneylender grabs two pebbles and puts them in, in the bag, and as he's doing that, the young girl whose whole future is at stake notices that he puts in two blue pebbles. So no matter which one she picks, she was going to lose, right? Because the blue means, that's it, you have to marry me. The green was, you go free, right? So let's stop freeze the action now, you know, back to modern time, we'll stop freeze the action here. Logically, what could she do? She go, hey, stop it, you made a mistake. <clears throat> you made a mistake, right? Right. Yeah. You accidentally made a mistake. You take the wrong ones. Or she could say, well, let's forget the whole deal before I even pick it because she knew it was going to be a rigged deal, you know? Neither one would do her much good. But because she had been in one of my seminars, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she had changed her thinking. What she did is she grabbed one of the pebbles, took it out, and then quickly dropped it in between all the other pebbles that were on the ground. And she said, oops, I'm so sorry, I'm so clumsy, I lost the pebble. However, you know which pebble it was by looking at the remaining one oh. in the bag. Yeah. Oh. 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 
Moneyland, of course, had no options, right? He would just say, well, I cheated. Uh, <laughs> he was like, tore up the papers, get him out of there. So, and that is what we got to do. We need to change our thinking because our current thinking has gotten us to where we are at now. If we want to go beyond that to the next step, we have to change the way we think. So, and that is what we're going to be working on. We're going to change the way we think. How are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we have to change our belief systems about what is happening. In other words, instead of believing in lack, we're going to have to start believing in abundance. Now, is the universe abundant? Yes. Yeah. In what way is it abundant? How many stars are there in the sky at night? Billions. There's, there's no lack or limitation there, is there? If you look at the blades of grass, are there just a few? Or is it in the billions again? If you're looking at the wildflowers that grow in the field, is there a lack or limitation there? Mm. No. I mean, you hear the birds, is there a number only that is allowed to sing? <laughs> <laughs> there is no limitation or lack anywhere in the universe. It is only in our own heads that lack exists. You know, that's the only place where it exists because the universe is very abundant in every area. So we have to understand that abundance is natural that it is unnatural not to be abundant. When you and I are not abundant in every area of our lives, it means you and I are doing something wrong and we want to change it. So the first belief system you want to create is that abundance is always available. That if you're not getting the abundance in whatever area you want to get it in, it means that you are doing something wrong and that you need to correct it because it's always available. A good example I like to use is love. Can you imagine a mom saying to her three-year-old daughter at the end of the day, well, I'm sorry, I can't give you any more love for the rest of this day because it's all used up on all the other kids. That would be a ludicrous statement, right? Right. Because there's no limitations to love, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that is it. That's the whole principle right there. It's a little bit like two children playing in the sand. You know, we have wonderful beaches here in California. I want you to imagine you're sitting on the beach, catching a few rays, reading a book, whatever you're doing, just staring at the ocean, and there are two kids playing right around you, and their parents have given them a little bucket, and in the bucket, they put sand from the beach. They put a lot of sand in there, so the kids are walking around with these buckets, and they're playing, and of course, the sand is falling out, and they're grabbing handfuls, and they're throwing it at each other. And at a given point in time, they happen to be right around where you're sitting, they're running out of sand. The sand is gone from the buckets, and they start to cry. And you say, what's the matter? Why are you kids crying? And say, well, there's no more sand in the bucket. What would you tell them? Oh, some more sand. Sand. Then look around you. There's all the sand you want. Just grab a handful. Can I do that? The kids say, yes. You know, put the sand in the bucket. Unlimited supply. Because what happens to the sand when you throw it up in the air? It's not going anywhere. Right? It's falling down again. So... This is true for money. It's true for love. I had a lady in one of my uh, classes once, and uh, she said, all the good men are taken. <laughs> I said, if you have that kind of a belief system, you're in real trouble. Because guess what kind of man she's going to attract if she believes that all the good ones are gone. Bad the bad ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she sort of stopped, and the lights went on in her head, you know, because she realized that that kind of a thought form, that kind of a belief system, will attract only the bad guys. She says, no wonder I've been having all these troubles. Yeah, you have to change your belief system. When I hear something like that, that all the good men are taken or I can't find somebody good, you know, if we were to make this a project just amongst us here, a little project here, I bet you could find anyone about a thousand possible good partners within five miles of where they live if they live in a big metropolitan area like this one. A thousand. And then if you go beyond that, you know, another... 5,000 or 10,000. And of course, you're not even counting the one and a half billion people in China at this point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The belief system is the one that's the problem, not the lack of enough nice people. There are plenty of nice people around. So change your belief system. Now, how do you do that? You, you believe, you make it clear to yourself, you repeat it on a daily basis and the mental training exercises we later on, we're going to actually use this, that abundance is always available to us. And that any time we want more abundance, all we have to do is mentally open up ourselves to it. 
And then later on, we do the mental training exercise. We're going to learn it at an inner level of the mind. Now, about what you want, there are three steps to take. First, what you want to do is you want to be grateful, thankful for what you already have. Very few people ever do that. Everybody says, well, give me more, give me more, give me more. Well, wait a second. How about being grateful for what you already have? That's the right mindset to have. To be grateful, if you already have good health, be grateful for that. If you already have lots of love, be happy about that. If you have $500 in the bank, hey, there are people that don't have a bank account. Be grateful for that. So be grateful for what you already have in order to attract more of what you want. That is the right mindset. That is the centered position that you want to function from rather than one from greed which pushes away. Just give me more, give me more, give me more is the wrong way to go about it. Be grateful for what you already have and then allow more to come into your life. Then the next step, that's step number one. Step number two is get rid of what you don't want. I bet you if I were to visit you, let's say you invite me for a cup of coffee and you show me your apartment, you show me the house and this is where the closet is, would you find some clothes you haven't worn in at least a year in your closet? Yes, we would. Would we find some old magazines, possibly, that you were going to read one of these days, or old newspapers or books that you bought that you never opened up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, um. right? Are you... Maybe get rid of what you don't want. This applies into any area of life. Do you have maybe a particular friendship where it is totally one way, where you're the only one that's being friendly and the other person does nothing but put you down? If that is true, you may want to strongly consider cutting off that particular friendship or at least diminishing the time that you spend with that person. Because if you have somebody that makes you negative and feel down all the time, that is not being very centered. So, again, you need to examine... What do I want and what do I not want? So get rid of what you don't want. Then make a written list, and I emphasize the word written, list of what you do want. There's power in writing things down. There's a huge difference between having it into your head and writing things down. The people that get what they want tend to have it in written form. That makes it real. Also, if you want more prosperity and abundance in your life, be open to receive. When you leave here, and as you're about to go to your car, you see a shiny dime in front of your left tire, mm-hmm. guess what I want you to do? Yeah. I want you to pick it up. Because if you don't, even if it's a penny, I want you to pick it up. Because if you don't, the message you're sending out is, I don't want any more. But it's dirty. You don't know where it's been. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you put it in a little tissue, and you clean it up. Yeah, right. <laughs> But you do not turn it down because then the message you're sending out, it is like a child. Remember what you heard in raising a child? It doesn't make any difference what you say, it's what you do. Well, this is really true for you in your life as well. It doesn't make any difference what you say. It is what you do. If you say, I want more money, and you find money and then you say no, it is your actions that determine what's going to happen next. So I want you to be open to receive. Even a dirty penny. How about... This ugly gift that you're getting for Christmas. <laughs> or the ugly gift. Or somebody says to you, you know, um, I'm cleaning this stuff up. Here's this lamp. Here, I'd like you to have this lamp. And you think this is the ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life. Now, rather than saying, well, I know, you know, your other neighbor mentioned to me that she really likes that lamp. <laughs> and trying to get rid of it that way. You don't say anything. You smile. You accept it gracefully. Thank her profusely for thinking of you that way. Appreciate her. And then turn around to the other neighbor and say, I have a wonderful (laughs) gift for you. (laughs) You see, but again, by turning down, if somebody wants to give you things, the message that you're sending out is, I don't want any more. So you want to accept gracefully all the things, even though you have no need for them immediately. Give it to somebody who can use it. Do not endorse any lack or limitation from other people. If you have somebody who's going to tell you about this company is uh, cutting down people or downsizing or, uh, you know, in this industry there are going to be problems, immediately shut that out. Do not accept limiting belief systems from other people. In other words, let's suppose that you hear that in this particular industry they're going to downsize. 
Well, the first question you want to ask yourself is, do I work in this industry? Well, if you don't work in this industry or don't, you don't have a close family member working in this industry, it has nothing to do with you to begin with, right? I mean, you feel empathy for the people that are going to be downsized, but you're not directly infected by that. So why get nervous or upset about it? You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's what people do. They, oh, my God, you know, and they get <laughs> upset yeah. and then tie in and, oh, you see, <gasps> get that sigh going. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> and if somebody says this is going to happen or it is, nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody's going to know what's going to happen in the stock market. No one has the faintest idea what's going to happen in the economy one or two or three years from now or in an industry one or two or three years from now. All kinds of things are possible within any time span. So take all these predictions with a huge grain of salt. You have to be aware of the fact that you're being influenced all the time and that you have the choice to accept or reject what other people are telling you. And what I'm telling you is to reject negativities from other people so that you can stay positive. Also, what you criticize decreases and what you praise increases. So if you have someone that gets a promotion, I want you to be really, truly happy for that person because that means that you can see it happening in front of you. Or if somebody makes an extra $10,000, I want you to be happy for that person. I want you to praise the fact that they did it. Okay? And I don't want you to criticize, to say, well, look at this guy driving a $60,000 car. Wait a second. You may want to drive a $60,000 car some years down the road. Don't criticize the person for spending the money. It's their money. You can spend it any way they want, right? Don't critique or criticize them. You know, somebody in an expensive car cuts you off on the freeway. Well, look at this. Rah, 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 rah. And we make that reference to that they're rich or that they have wealthy and that is why they feel they can get away with it. Well, hey, I've been cut off by people in the most horrible jalopies you can think of. And the thought never occurred to me to say that they did it because they were poor. So why should we blame someone for, you know, so it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But what if the guy who gets a promotion gets a promotion you should have gotten? How do you deal with that? Well, first of all, you don't want to believe in limited supply. That means, is that is the only promotion there is? Is that the only company there is? Is that the only position there is? Is that the only department there is? You see, we believe this is it. And if I don't get one, my whole life is ruined. Then you set yourself up for a fall. So what that means, the approach to take is, when you want something, the approach to take is this or something better. I want this promotion or something better than this. And that way, you open yourself up to, if you don't get this particular promotion that you think logically is what you should get, maybe the universe has something better in mind for you. And you want to be open to that possibility rather than shut down and get angry, upset, and negative because you didn't get what you thought you should be getting. Works very powerfully that way. And let me put it to you this way. There is no one can hold down a person who has the right kind of abilities. It's impossible to do. It's like somebody trying to hold down a cork in a glass of water. Sooner or later, you have to let go of the cork. What happens when you let go? It pops to the surface, right? So if the abilities are not recognized, if your talents and abilities are not recognized at where you're at, then you want to find out who will recognize and pay for my talents and abilities and not only set it up for yourself, well, this is the only way I want to do it. And one of the things that I always advise people is that if you want to get a promotion at work, one of the things you always want to do is go to the person who is capable of giving you that promotion. I had a lady in class who had a very similar question to yours, and she said to me, oh, I want a promotion. Good. I said, there's nothing wrong with that. I said, does your boss know about this? She says, oh, yeah, I've been hinting at this for years. I said, well, the first thing you have to understand is, is, is your boss a man? She says, yes. So the first thing you have to understand is that men don't get hints. Step number one. <laughs> it's okay to laugh at that. I'll let you do that. I'm a man, so I can take it. Men don't get hints. A lot of women think that they are crystal clear about explaining what they want, while the poor male doesn't have the faintest idea that that's what they want. I said, the odds are excellent that your boss has no idea whatsoever that you want a promotion. She's been hinting at it for years. 
I said, well, how have you been hinting? She said, well, I've been dropping little hints here and there. I said, that, that works fine with other females, but the great majority of men does not get that. You have to come straight out and say, what do I need to do to get a promotion? She says, that's straightforward? I said, oh, absolutely. I said, I want you to take a pad, paper with you, go sit down, make sure there's enough time for a discussion, and say, I have a question, I'd like to chat with you, fine, come on down. So what specific steps do I need to do to get a promotion in this company? I said, and then you listen very carefully and you write down every step that's being mentioned to you. And when you're done, you review all the steps, make sure you got it right, and then at the end of which you say, is there anything else you can think of I may have to do other than the things you already mentioned? And the person will think, mm, mm, thinking, thinking. No, this is it. So in other words, what you're telling me, if I do all the things that you just <laughs> listed for me, you're going to give me a promotion, right? Well, there's only one answer to that one, right? And that is, yes. So what is your job then? You do all the things on the list. And you keep on showing. You know, once in a while you show up and say, by the way, remember those five things on the list? I did number one, two, and three. Here they are. You know, documented. Getting there. So get yourself ready here. You know, start printing my business cards. <laughs> you see, you make people commit. You tell them, tell me what I have to do, and then you do it. Then there is no backing or veering away. But you have to deal with the person who can fulfill, of course. If you talk to somebody else who has to talk to somebody else, then they always have that third party to go, well, I want to give this to you, but this bad person on top of you doesn't want to give it to you. But you need to become clear about what you want, first of all, in your own head. And then if other people are going to give you what you want, you need to tell them what you want. You cannot expect them to sort of mind read that. Even though you feel they ought to, they're not going to. Everybody is in their own little world, you know. They have their own things they're worried about, their own concerns about it. You are one of 50 people they're dealing with. You have to keep that in mind. You have to understand human nature, right? And you have to also understand that uh, a lot of people will not take any action unless they pressed to do something. So you need to set it up where there's some pressure here. And the pressure is, tell me what to do, and then you do it. That's pressure, right? But that's the right kind of pressure because they're setting up the terms, right? They're creating the terms and you're fulfilling the terms. You have to keep in mind that all companies, the only reason they exist is to make money, to earn a profit for their stockholders. If they're a large company or for if it's a privately owned company, for the people that own it, that's the only reason for their existence. I mean, they may want to do all kinds of wonderful things and they may want to help and they want to provide wonderful services and products, but unless they earn a profit, they're not going to exist. So therefore, the number one thing that you want to do is what can I do to help my company become more profitable? Okay, so what you praise increases. Let's go back to this for a second. So what you praise increases. So praise. You know when you see somebody win something in the lottery, praise it. This is wonderful. I'm so happy for them. When you see somebody get a promotion, be happy for that person. Because let's help this person get another promotion so you can take their place. <laughs> if you want a promotion, you should do everything in your power to help this person above you get promoted to a higher level. Because, if, first of all, if you do everything in your power to help this person, they're going to be very appreciative of that because they understand real quick what's going on, right? And you may want to actually come straight out and tell them that. I'm a very firm believer in coming straight out and telling people exactly what it is. Say, I tell you what, I'm going to do everything in my power to help you get a promotion. Now, of course, on the flip side of that, what I would like you to do when you do get a promotion, I want you in the strongest possibly terms to recommend me for your old job. Fair enough, Kim? And what is Kim going to say? Yes. You see? Yeah. It's, it's not hard. You understand how people think, right? It's not hard. You help me, I'll help you. Okay. Also, a lot of negativity comes from the news. I don't want you to go on any diet except a news diet. If you are in the habit of listening to the evening news before you go to sleep, I would strongly suggest you stop doing that. Because that is what you take to sleep with you. All the problems and negativities and murders and killings all over the world. That's not a good way to go to sleep on because your subconscious will keep on working on that. So, that, does that mean you have to give up the news? No. 
you can still watch the news. That's what you want to do. But after that, then read some positive, interesting, motivating material. Or listen to some wonderful tapes, maybe. <laughs> and then go to sleep. In the morning, don't turn on the morning news shows. Of course, that's the same thing. Again, you hear all the stuff that's been happening in the last 12 hours. Put them some nice music, some positive things that you like. You, you enjoy some music. I like Latin beat, you know, so kick on. Some nice Latin music. Makes me positive. You know what I'd like you to do? I'd like you to make a list of all the things that make you feel good. Before you go to sleep tonight, I'd like you to do that. Make a list of all of the things that you do that make you feel good. When I'm tired and a little hurt, uh, if I take a hot shower, it makes me feel great afterwards. Shower, for me, does it every time. A nice long shower, man, I'm ready to go out. And even though I might not have had any sleep, it works for me. Going to your alpha level, of course, is a real good centering way of doing that. Uh, listening to music for a lot of people gets them up, the right kind of music. What kind of things did you do, you guys? Tell me. What kind of things do you do that make you feel up and good? Spending money. Spending money, Kim <laughs> says. But you also have a belief system that money runs out at the end of the month, right? Isn't that the one? Cancel that thought. All right. Hey, she's getting it. She's getting it. Cancel, cancel. <laughs> Spending money, but spend it in the right way. In other words, don't spend money to make you feel good. Find a healthy substitute for that because now you create another problem, right? If you spend too much money, then you're going to feel bad about spending so much money, feel guilty about it afterwards, right? And then, of course, you have that stuff sitting that you bought and it's sitting in a bag somewhere, in your closet somewhere, and then one of these days you're going to return it for a refund. <laughs> and then what happens is you don't do that for about two or three months and then you forget where the receipt is. Oh, dear. Do, do I know you? Yes. No? no? Not sure. I give too much. It's, uh, I love giving. Giving? Sometimes. Okay. And so sometimes I overdo. Sometimes. Well, but it's perfectly okay to give gifts to other people, but don't do it to make you feel good. Well, I just do it out of the pleasure of giving, not I feel down today, so I'm going to buy mm -hmm. stuff to right. give to other people because right. that is going to make me feel good. Find a healthier substitute for mm -hmm. that, such as maybe do 10 jumping jacks mm -hmm. or uh, you know, run around the blocks or boogie to some music for 20 minutes. Find a healthier substitute. Once you feel good, then go out and buy some gifts, and people appreciate the gift itself, not how much it costs. So you can buy gifts for 2 or $3 that people are going to be far happier with than one that costs you $80. Because if the $3 gift is exactly tailor-made to what they really like, they're going to be far more appreciative of than the much more expensive gifts that they feel so-so about. Hand-drawing a card and personalizing to what they know I like, that is to me far more worth than a, a $200 whatever. So you can still give the gifts and be happy about giving, but do it when you're feeling good, not when you're feeling bad. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay. So the news fast we're talking about, let's finish that up. One way of doing it is just read the newspaper, because if you read the newspaper, you can choose what you want to read. If you listen to it on radio or TV, you basically are letting in everything. So by reading, you can pick up and choose what you want to read. Now, if you want to increase your prosperity, a couple of things that I'd like you to do. First of all, you want to think more prosperous. So how do you think more prosperous is by doing things that you only would do if you had an increase in income. So maybe there's a very expensive restaurant that you say, you know, I would love to go there. But in the past, you've said, but I can't afford it. It's too much money. I want you to go there. You don't have to go for dinner. Go for dessert. Walk in. You know, if you're with someone, say, we just came in, we already ate, we just came in because we have heard you have the most wonderful pies in, in town. And they'd be happy to see you. They'll sit you down, and the pie, whatever it is, four bucks, five bucks for the pie, and uh, if you want a cup of coffee with us, so for six dollars, you're sitting in the most expensive restaurant in town. And you get to enjoy the atmosphere. You know, you get to enjoy the surroundings to see what it is like, to try it on for size, and get your mind accustomed that it is okay to be in places like that. The same thing with very expensive stores that you normally would never go to. Go buy a tie there, the guys, you know? Go buy a $20 tie there. You don't have to spend $1,000. Go buy 20 Get used to feeling comfortable shopping for things in that kind of a place. 
Get your mind conditioned to that. And sometimes, by the way, uh, these huge, big, expensive stores have little sales on, like 50% off sales, where it's actually cheaper to buy there than it would be to buy in your regular store. So you go there, and if you, your budget says, I only am going to buy it on sale, fine. But buy something there. You're much better off buying one good shirt or blouse than three cheap ones. You're going to get more fun of it, more pleasure, it'll last longer. It makes you feel better, makes you feel good. You see, all of these things have to do with the mindset, right? Now, from the ancient, from way, way back, there is the power of 10. And the power of 10 says, if you want to increase anything, write it down 10 times. It's a very ancient belief system that has been used for many hundreds of years. You know, secret knowledge type thing where that is not being given out. So if you want, let's say, so much money in the bank, you would write it down 10 times. If you want to uh, get rid of anything or diminish it, write it down 15 times from the same old belief system. You want to get rid of your debts? So all my debts are paid 15 times. No more debts 15 times. So to increase, you want to use the power of 10. To decrease, you want to use the power of 15. Of course, this is hundreds of years old and is being passed on from you know, one group to the other group, the power of 10. Uh, the number 10 seems to be a powerful number anyway. As a matter of fact, I like to uh, tell my students to use the power of 10 when they write checks. In other words, when you write a check to someone, expect 10 times that in return. Isn't it a nice way of doing it? You know, you send a check to somebody for three or four or five hundred dollars, or you pay your rent or your mortgage, and then you expect 10 times that back. So you pay 500, you expect $5,000 to come to you from, you don't know where it's going to come from, but you can expect it to come to you in some way, somehow, some form. Say somebody has written everything down, has taken loads of action steps, and yet the results have not come in the way that was programmed years ago. Okay, so the question is, what do you do if what you want is not happening? Right, and yes, be grateful for the little stuff, but then... Let's have the big stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. well, first of all, the one thing you need to become aware of, which is a lot of people don't do, is you need to check your feedback. The feedback will tell you what is happening. Mm -hmm. If the problems that you encounter in this particular goal are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, in other words, you solve one problem, now you have a bigger problem, you solve that one, now it's a more, uh, even larger problem, you solve that one, it's an even larger problem, the odds are you're on the wrong road. If, however, the problems you encounter, you solve the first one, and the second one, still a problem, but a little less, you solve that one, the next problem, still a little less, it means you're on the right track. You see, you want to examine. When you want to climb the ladder of success, the first thing you want to check is it leading against the right wall. You know, check that. Because sometimes people have goals they, they have that are old goals, and they don't want them anymore. But they still have that old goal because they set it five years ago, or somebody else set that goal for them. You know, like a f family member or somebody else says, well, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. And you say, eh, okay, this is not your goal. So check your goal. The first thing you want to do is check your desire for it. Do you really, truly want it? Are you willing to do all the steps necessary to get there for this particular goal? Are you willing to spend, let's say, an extra 10, 15 hours getting yourself educated in this particular area, reading up, doing research? Are you willing to do this? People say, well, I don't know about that. Well, maybe you really don't want to go. You know, mere wishes doesn't get the job done. The universe responds to people that are very clear about what they want. Mm -hmm. If you are ever want to test that out, next time you go to the mall, they usually have one big store to one side of the mall and one big store to the other side of the mall. Pick one of those. And while all the people are sort of milling around, window shopping, I want you to pick a goal that your goal is to reach the other side of the mall quickly and decisively. And then you start walking. And an amazing thing is going to happen. The people make a path for you. 
they will just move out of your way because you're the only person in the world that has a particular destination in mind. Everybody else just milling around. And that is how it happens in real life. So you need to be clear about what you want. That's step number one. Take all the time you need to first become clear about what you want because it all stems from there. And really examine. And ask yourself the question, am I willing to pay the price to get this? Because there's always some kind of a price tag attached. And the price tag could be giving up some leisure time. It could be having to do some additional travel. It could be having to do more studying. It could be many. I don't know. You don't know. And sometimes you may not have to do these things, but you have to be willing to do these things. The key word here is the willingness. Now, let's suppose that you do, that you pick a specific goal and that you're willing to do the steps necessary to get to your goal. Then you check the feedback. And if the feedback becomes more problems and more problems, then look for a different road to get to your goal. This particular road is not getting you there. Doesn't mean you have to give up your goal just means that you have to use a different avenue. Of course, the universe is giving you a report card every day, telling you, you never have to wonder how you're doing. Check to see how the progress is. Are there problems? More and more problems? More and more? More and more? Check it out. Maybe you're hacking your way through the jungle, and 10 feet away is a nice freeway. <laughs> you don't want to do that one, right? don't want to reinvent the wheel. So... Check your feedback. That is very powerful. And basically, one of the things you want to work with are your strengths. Do things. Find out what you're good at. You already really know. It's just a question of getting it to the surface. Questions to ask yourself are, what did I say I wanted to do when I was a child? What did you say you wanted to do? Did you say when you said, I always want to be this or have this or become this? And then did you forget about your dream? Because so-called lies realities said, well... There's no openings in a particular field. Or it takes eight years of study to do that. I need to earn money now, so I better find another job. So, what do other people say that you're good at? What do other people say? Your friends at work, your friends at home, your relatives, what do they say that you're good at? And ask them if you're not sure. So, by the way, I'm doing a little project that I learned in the seminar here. One of the things I want to know is uh, I'm supposed to make a list of all the things that I'm good at. Can you tell me what I'm good at, in your opinion? And you'll be amazed what you're going to hear because the odds are that you take it totally for granted that you can do that. Of course, it comes easy to you. It's natural to you. So to you, it's no big deal. Yeah, to you, it's no big deal. I had a lady in my class a couple of months ago. And she says, everybody, everybody has been telling me all my life, all my adult life, that I'm a great cook. She says, but what, how can, what can I do with that? I said, you know that one of the quickest growing occupation is going to be a personal cook. Mm -hmm. If you're really great at cooking, if you let your friends and neighbors in your neighborhood know that instead of when they come home, that you will have homemade cooking available for them, all they have to do is stop by, pick it up, you're going to get lots and lots of takers. What a neat idea. Mm -hmm. People are tired of the quick fast food stuff. They don't want to stop by. They want to go home. And here, you know, a block away, every day, nice fresh menu. And you cook for 10 or 20 families in your area. You stay at home. You don't have to go out. Don't fight. Rush hour traffic. She's doing it now. It's a lady in uh, one of my classes. She's going at it. She's doing it. She started it immediately. That's what I like. Give out an idea. I want people to go out and do it now. Don't wait. Go for it. So again, here, this is a skill that nobody thought had any value. This is what you want to do. You want to find out what you're good at, right? Number one. And then you want to find out what do people want. And then you find a match. In other words, take your skills and match it up with what people want. Match it up with what people want. I had a salesman. He was great at selling, he said to me. He said, but the one thing that he hated the most was making phone calls to set up appointments. I said, do you know someone who is great at making phone calls? He says, yeah, my wife is wonderful at it. I said, well, have you ever considered asking her to make phone calls for you? He said, No. I said, well, <laughs> gee, I would suggest you go to her and say, honey, how about if you and I are going to make a nice cruise by the end of the year, if we increase my income by 36%, the price is going to be a nice cruise to wherever you want to go. You think she might be interested in making some phone calls for you? And she says, oh, yes, mm -hmm. she would love that. Mm -hmm. So right around him, you know, here he's doing something that he hates to do, he's not good at. 
I read a story uh, about the 1988 Olympics and the coach of the ping pong team, it's table tennis officially, right? But I call it ping pong. <laughs> the coach of the ping pong team was interviewed and asked because they have all these uh, people from China who are just winning, who are winning all the medals. And so the Chinese coach was interviewed and asked, he says, well, how do you, how do you people train? And he says, they train eight hours a day on their strengths. And the interviewer said, excuse me? He said, you don't have them train uh, on the weaknesses? And he says, no, they spend some time on the weaknesses, but they spend almost all of their time developing their strengths, making them stronger, stronger, and stronger, and stronger. He says, for instance, the guy that won a gold medal, he says his backhand isn't very good, but his forehand is so good that people are happy to get the ball back, never mind trying to get it to his backhand. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. You see? So the hmm. check your strengths. What are you good at? And then work with it. Find an element within your current work to develop that. If you are a wonderful organizer, go to somebody in your office who is in charge and say, you know, I want to help you organize this office. I want to work half time what I'm doing now. The other half time, I want to organize this office because it's going to increase productivity. I figured it out in a little numbers form. I figure I can improve productivity by 20%, which should add 10% to your bottom line. Are you interested in adding 10% to your bottom line? Well, who isn't, right? So you get to work within your strengths now. Guess what's going to, how are you going to feel when you work in an area that you already have a natural feel for, a natural strength for? How's that going to make you feel? Good. It's going to make you feel very good. People, everybody enjoys doing things that they're naturally good at. Think about that. So find ways to match your strength with what your company wants or be in business for yourself with what the marketplace wants. And one of the biggest misconceptions is still being taught is to find a need and fill it. That's not true. Many people have gone broke trying to fill needs. What you want to do is find a want and fill it. People spend their money on wants, not on needs. An old bum is standing in front of a couple of stores. He has one shoe with the sole is plopping off. Shoe store on the one side, liquor store on the other side. And you come by and he says, man, he said, look at my shoe. I need a new pair of shoes, man. He said, look, new pair of shoes, I can get them for 10 bucks. Can you help me out? And you say, well, how much you got? He said, I got two bucks. He said, okay, here's eight. Go buy yourself a new pair of shoes. And you walk away. And all of a sudden, you get this funny feeling and you look around to see, is he going to go into the shoe store or is he going to go, by any chance, into the liquor store? Which store do you think he's going to go into? He wants to buy a bottle of booze and he needs a pair of shoes. What's the answer? Liquor. liquor. Yeah. People do what they want, not what they need. And you need to understand the difference. So a need and a want combined, that's it. You, know? you can combine two. They need it and they want it. That's perfect. So find out what people want and then you provide it. If that is one of your areas of strength. Let's talk a little bit about how to be a great communicator. You know what? Every great communicator is first of all a good listener. You ever observe that? Most people do not listen. What they do in their head is you're talking to them and you think they're listening to you. But what they're doing in their head is they're thinking about what they're going to say as soon as you shut up. You see, they're not really listening to you. They're listening to you with half an ear. And the other side of the brain is very busy trying to figure out how they're going to answer you or what they're going to ask you next. And sometimes I do interviews with people and I can literally see that. I look at the interview and I see the interviewer already trying to formulate the next question in his or her head. And I'll stop him and say, wait a second, pay attention to the answer I'm giving you now because there's a lot of value in this for you. So before you start asking me the next question, let's listen to the answer to the first question. Because if you only want to ask questions, you're not going to learn anything. Listen to the answer and do something with it. So you want to become a good listener. How do you become a good listener? By focusing your full attention on the person that you're with and who is talking to you. So all you need, any distracting thoughts, set them aside. Stay focused. Stay focused. And that is how you become a great listener. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you something to do. Next time you go to a get-together where there are a lot of people that you don't know, I want you to have somebody that you know 
a friend of yours, and you say, I'm going to talk to this person over there. And after I'm done talking, I want you to go to this person and ask them, after I'm gone, the kind of a person that I am. They don't know me. You've never heard of me before, right? And I want you to go to this person, and I just want you to talk to this person. I don't want you to say anything about you. Just talk about them. So if I were to be talking to Diane, for instance, I'd say, hi, Diane, how long have you been living here? About 15 years. 15 years. Do you enjoy living here? Yeah, I like it a lot. Like it a lot? Where did you live before? New York. New York. Ooh, a little colder over there, right? A lot colder. How, how about the difference in lifestyle between the East Coast and the West Coast? I actually like New York better. A little, little, little why? Because it's more about thinking and it's more cerebral than out M- here. More energy? <laughs> yeah. Not as it's laid excited. back, yeah, right? right. <laughs> People talk to each other and that, right. that's an yell at each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's exciting. Have, have you been back visiting visit yeah, recently? Not often enough, no. When is the last time you went there? About two years ago. Mm-hmm. But I'm ready to go anytime. <laughs> yeah. You're planning to go maybe sometime this year? Or? Yeah, I want to get work that'll send me back there. Okay. Well, I'll make that one of your goals, you know? It is. Yeah. Oh, good. Put that right. one of your list of goals. Good. <laughs> now, let's suppose, Kim, you go over to Diane and ask her. The guy that you just saw over there, what kind of a guy is he? Ask her the question. Diane, what kind of a guy is he? <laughs> He's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> now you notice, you notice? You see what happened here? This is really what will happen to you. I didn't say one thing about me, did I? Mm-hmm. Not one word. I didn't say, well, I like California too, you know. No, 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 I didn't say anything like that. Or I like New York too, you know. No, I didn't say anything about what my opinion was. I just focused on her. I paid attention to her, didn't look at anybody else, didn't think of anything else. I was just very focused and listened very carefully to what she had to say. And my questions were directly to her answer, not out of left field, right field. It is so flattering to have somebody pay total attention to you. You cannot help but like that person. (laughs) Absolutely. So become a real good listener and you become a great communicator. You see? And the people say afterwards, Boy, she was really nice, and boy, she's intelligent, too. (laughs) (laughs) Because, you see, they're going to give you all kinds of wonderful qualities just because she listened well. Wonderful qualities just... (laughs) Many salespeople miss the boat totally. If any salesperson is here or listening to this tape, I want you to not start talking about what you have to offer unless you first have literally interviewed the person you're talking with and gotten all the information. And then only then... Do you turn around and fit what you have with what they just told you and make it fit in? Many people lose many sales because they're talking about areas that the person listening has absolutely no interest in. And talk to people on their terms. In other words, you have to talk to people in their areas of interest. So if I were to continue to talk to Diane, let's suppose I was trying to sell her something. And I was had chatted with her, and she's telling me that she likes to be able to talk to people, to have friends and what have you, you know. And I say, let's suppose I have a, a charm school or something like that uh, I wanted to enroll in. And I say, you know, if you were to enroll in, in this particular school, you will find it even easier to talk to all kinds of people. Is that something you would be interested in? Absolutely. Now, I already know that, right? Because she t- told me that she's interested in that as one of her reasons you want to go back to the East Coast. So I tied in what she already told me she's interested in with one of the features of my product or service. See how easy it is if you do it on that basis. You don't have to high pressure anyone. Find out what the person wants and then if you have something that will fulfill their wants, you give it to them. See, many of the great salespeople do it all like that. Great salespeople are not backslapping high pressure people at all. That is a total misconception that we have because of movies and TV and what have you. They are very good listeners. They pay real attention. They remember what you said. And then they find the features in their product that match what you want. And then you walk away and you feel good about having purchased this product. And that's how it's supposed to work, right? That you feel good afterwards. So, and everybody, of course, is in sales. You have to understand that. You're always selling a product or you're selling yourself or you're selling your ideas. So we all need to become good communicators if we want to get out of life what we want. Okay, we talked about desire a little earlier. Believe, believe that you can. That's the second step. First, you have the strong desire. Then you have to believe that it is possible for you. 
How do you do that? Well, um, give me, you have one of your goals you can use as an example? Um, sure, to to get more money to, well, I just need to market a TV talk show I have right now. And okay. capital, lack of capital seems to be my obstacle. Okay. So marketing, well, believing in myself enough when I'm talking to people who might sponsor the show. Well, do you believe, in other words, uh, in other words, first of all, do you believe in the concept that you're offering? Yes, I do. Okay, good. So that's step number one. Yes. You see, if you do not, that will come through. People pick up information okay. from each other all the time that's a good at question. a subconscious level. In other words, you meet someone, and after a few minutes of talking to this person, you like this person, or you don't like this person, even though you didn't talk about anything, or you feel neutral about them, right? You, you make up your mind real quickly about people. Now, that is not because the actual words that were said, it's the body language, it's the tonality, it's the way they approach you, it's the way they looked at you, whether they feel comfortable within themselves. You pick up all these dozens and maybe hundreds of different little things. Your brain picks those all up, files them away, and sort of runs it through the computer, and you make up your mind. You like this person, you don't like this person. So, the same thing is true. You first, if you want to sell something to somebody else, which is what you're doing, is you need to be completely, totally convinced about the value of what you have to offer. Well, I do believe there's a value, but you're right. I do have a teeny little doubt that perhaps it's not as, um, doesn't reach the common denominator. Maybe there's a teeny dot doubt that says, well, maybe it's too highbrow, maybe there's too small of an audience, maybe, maybe. Well, there is you see, you want, to, you want to go check it out. Now. You want to go and find out ways that you can do something to show that you remove that little doubt, because that little doubt is coming through. Right. I promise you it's coming through. <laughs> People will pick it up. They don't know they're picking it up. They just say, well, I don't know, let me think about it, and they put you on that long, long waiting list, you know, <laughs> down the road here, you know, call me in five years, that <laughs> thing, you know. So they're picking up the doubt. So you want to revise it then to the point where you put enough elements in there so that you feel totally 100% sold on the concept. Mm -hmm. You see, enthusiasm and belief are two critical things in getting other people to go along with you. Mm -hmm. See, many people will be sitting on the fence. It will be, well, you know, they're close, but they're not sure. If you have a total belief in what you have to offer, mm -hmm. that, that will then get them off the fence, you see, because people hook into the belief. People buy things emotionally. Even though they calculate it out and they run the numbers by, it is still an emotional decision. At some level, we're buying you as a human person, as a human being. I'm thinking I'm going to work with her, you know, or I'm going to get along, she's going to be easy to get along. All these thoughts are flying by when I'm trying to make a decision or whether or not to do business with you. Mm -hmm. So you want to go back and make sure that you are 100% sold on your concept. And if you're sold in a concept, and then you program the end result, right? We're talking about end result programming. End result means you see the final result as if it has already happened. So you already have a talk show on the air, and it is successful, would be the end result for you. Mm -hmm. Not an in-between step, not finding the money, not finding the right backers, because in order for it to be on the air and successful, all these things must have fallen in place. So do not be concerned about in-between steps on how to get there because there are 84,000 different ways things can come about and nobody is smart and intelligent enough to figure out all the possible ways. So therefore, do not bother trying to figure out all the possible ways. Focus on the end result and then be mentally alert and intuitive about the things that are happening around you. So if someone says to you, you know, some maybe you ought to call this and this person, that you don't dismiss that but that you actually get on the phone and then follow up. Because as soon as you start having an end result that is, you mentally conceive this end result and you believe in it, then things will start happening. And you need to follow through. Because if you don't follow through, then of course the whole thing doesn't work. So your job is to follow through on the ideas and thoughts that you get once you have your end result firmly in mind. Thank you very much. I appreciate your feedback. Hi, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to become like a slave to my success. Like, you know, I'm going to have to work <laughs> like 18 hours a day. And, you know, so I'm kind of shy away from trying to bring in more abundance in my life. Well, how many hours a week do you work now? 20 to 30. 20 to 30? Heavy load? 
Yeah, <laughs> I love it. You love it? Yeah. Why not set it up? In other words, people create all kinds of rules for themselves that are non-existing. You know, they just make them up. So if you have a rule that if I want to make more money, I have to work more hours, then of course it's going to happen that way. How about if you set up a rule that you want to increase your income by what percentage? 100. Okay, I want to double my income and work the same number of hours that I'm currently working. Would that be a good one for you? Yeah, that's, in fact, that's how I achieve where I'm at. Hey, exactly did that. Why not continue to do it? And not create a rule. What do you do with a rule that says it means I have to work harder? What do you do with it? You cancel out that false belief system because there is show to me where it says that you must work harder to do that. As a matter of fact, the odds are that they should become better and better that you can even work fewer hours to accomplish it. Hours. I guess the question is, do I deserve it? Yeah. Ah, you see, now we're dealing with the underneath question. And then the question is, why wouldn't you? You have to ask yourself, well, instead of making it a generality like that, do I deserve this, which you can't do anything with, is there any reason that I can think of, you ask yourself this question, is that it would not be okay for me to double my income? And you find out, you're not going to find any reason. Now, if you feel that I don't want to be selfish about this, make an arrangement with yourself. If I double my income, I will take 20% of that and then you pick whatever you want to do with a 20%. Pick an area or give it away or, you know, whatever you want to do with it. It's something that's going to make you feel good. So, all of a sudden, we're taking away the, I'm not deserving of this. By having you identify why specifically don't you deserve that. Well, if you can't come up with any reason that you really don't, it's just some vague thought that having too much money is bad. Mm-hmm. Or you have to work really hard to earn it, which is, of course, another belief system that you have, right? You have to cancel out those belief systems. And then we all should do that. You know, I have a favorite cause that once in a while I send a nice check to. They send me a little thank you note back. Thank you very much for your generous donation. It makes me feel very good. Mm. It makes them feel very good, too, because they need the money. (laughs) So you find some that you really enjoy or like or some that you believe in. And you set it up for yourself. I'm going to double my income and I take X percentage of that and I will give it to them. Mm-hmm. Have other people participate in it. Like a reward system? Reward system. You see, all of a sudden, even if there's any doubt or fear there about deserving it, hey, how can you not deserve it when you're giving it away, right? Mm-hmm. To a favorite cause. People really need it. So you take care of it right there and then. Neutralize any fears, doubts, or not deserving. A lot of people, by the way, have that belief system. But I don't deserve it. But when I make people pin down why not, they can't come up really with any reason. And all of a sudden, then it will go away because if you cannot come up with any reason, then go for it, right? Right. And by the way, there's something that I really want you to do. If you have a goal, I want you to celebrate. I want you to enjoy it. And not go, okay, I did this one. Let's go to the next one. No, 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 no. Stand back. Have things in balance. Enjoy life. Have a good time with it. Take people you like out for dinner. You know, party. Have a good time. And then relax. And then you set up your next goal. But enjoy your accomplishment. Don't be rushing off to the next thing. You know, stand back from it. Smell the flowers a little. So you do things like that to balance things out. Because fine, you're doubling your income. So financially, you're very happy now. You're still only working 20 to 30 hours a week. So hey, there's no problem there. So you have this time. What are you going to do with this time? You want to do something useful. with Don't watch TV and stuff. Old reruns. You've seen those before. (laughs) So go do some fun. Pick something that you really enjoy. The person you're with also really enjoys. And both of you go out and do it. And you can make that part of the reward system. Set up a little reward system for yourself. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and then expectation. And that is to expect it to happen. Now, expectation, so we have desire, we're going to believe it, and then we're going to expect it. We're going to think it is very natural for this to happen. And when you have any doubts or fears, what do you do? You cancel them out. So if you have those three ingredients, you're going to get to your goals the quickest way possible. So... Those are powerful tools that you have there. Now, yeah. How does timing figure in all this? In in other words, is there a certain point where you've been doing it and you're not sure if it's coming through and you just have to be more patient? 
or is your ladder against the wrong wall? Well, yeah, timing. You see, people tend to use time and sort of say, well, it has to happen by that and that day. Well, you may be off. Maybe it will take longer. And maybe it will be less. So I would be very loose on the time element. As far as when you do your visualizations at Alpha, there is no time there. So at Alpha, you want to already see the whole thing done, accomplished, meaning now. One of my seminars, I do a little thing with a $10,000 bill. And one of the gentlemen in my class came up to me during the break. He says, I love everything, but I have a hard time believing that I can get an extra ten grand without having to really work for it or, or really do things for it. Because the way I set it up is the, an extra $10,000 is going to come to you. And I said, well, I know that goes totally against any and all of your old belief systems. And I said, but you just go with it and see what happens. He says, because to me, it would maybe three months, six months, nine months, a year, I could say, but now? I said, yeah, you work from the now. I have it now. And it may take three months or, or six months before it materializes, but mentally you already have it. He says, okay, I got a call Monday afternoon. Seminar ended Sunday night. Monday afternoon, he calls me, and he's on the time zone three hours away. He said, you're not going to believe this one. I said, well, try me. <laughs> he says, I walked in my office and there was a voicemail message for me to call an old, old client of mine I've been talking to for years and years and years. And we had a deal, but nothing ever materialized of it. He says, and when I called him back, he says, this guy said to me, he says, you know, Sunday afternoon, which is the time that he and I were talking about, mm -hmm. Sunday afternoon, I had this thought, I've been stalling and waiting and delaying on this and enough of it already, let's just go do the deal. Guess how much the net profit was out of this deal? Ten thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So, how long did it take? Twelve hours. <laughs> can we do that one now? <laughs> <laughs> sure, that <I> yeah. <laughs> you can set it up any way you want, but yeah, you have to create that you're open to it. Be open to this. You need to first be open to when the mind is shut. Nothing happens. It goes by you. You have to be open to all possibilities. And when you start doubting, you keep on canceling those things out and replacing with a positive. So, what you do with your goals is you want to visualize. Yeah. In business, I have to set goals to you know maintain certain uh, income flow to the company. Right. So if I don't meet those goals, I lose my income flow. And so, you know, that's based upon how many clients I have and 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 what I book, et cetera, et cetera. How does it work on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis? How do you keep track? Well, well, if I visualize a goal and it's not based upon time, and then, but I, I do have time goals associated with the business, and if I don't meet those time goals, I'll start to naturally doubt. Okay, let me ask you a question. How do you keep track? Is it on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis? Weekly. Weekly basis? Now, in that case, of course, you would use time. We're talking about, let's suppose, getting a promotion, which is an unknown quantity. could happen two months from now, six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. You would see it already happen. You also would see it already happen. But you would do, let's say, on Friday evening, the numbers come out, right? Okay, you would see on Friday, you put the date next to it, you would see X amount of sales. Mm -hmm. So you would then use the time element with it that by this Friday, I will have sold whatever it is that you would be happy with. If you have a monthly goal where there's maybe a monthly sheet on the wall that shows the top producers, mm -hmm. you would see yourself on top, on the top levels. So you would use time in that sense. And then, of course, it is incumbent on you to do the things that you need to do, make the phone calls, go out, make the visits, and all of that. Right. But first of all, internally, you want to already have that many sales. It's already done in your mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is where visualization takes place. So you visualize your end result. How do you visualize your end result? You see it on the sheet that you normally have. Mm -hmm. In other words, make it real. If you have it on a particular sheet in your calendar or wherever you have it or it's, it's on a separate whatever you use, you would mentally see the date of the next Friday's date and you would then see how many sales. If you have a monthly goal, you would see the end of the month. Mentally, it has already happened. You already have it. Now, at the physical objective level, you still have to go out and do the work, of course. Right. But, you see, if the goal is clear up here, then you automatically will do the right things to take the right actions and call the right people to get there. If the goal is unclear, you're not going to get any help. 
So you want to be mentally clear about specifically what it is that you want and be unconcerned about whom is going to buy the product or service. It doesn't make any difference to you. Some salespeople, do they focus all their attention on this one person? And then when that one person doesn't buy, they go, oh my God, the whole month is shot because that's the one I counted on. Become totally unconcerned about whom is going to buy. Hmm. Because the only thing that counts is the numbers at the end, right? right? I mean, you don't care whether it was person A or person B or person C. See, that way you take away all the pressure because you allow it to come any way it wants to as long as it gets there, right? It doesn't make any difference. Right. So subjectively, it is already done internally. Objectively, physically, you have to do make the phone calls, get yourself centered, do all the right things that you know how to do. So I... I need to ask this. So what happens the first time that I, I, I do the visualization and I, I visualize I'm going to bring in a certain amount of income by the end of the week or by the end of the month mm -hmm. and what happens if I don't meet that? What, what, what do I do? Well, then you give yourself credit for what you did do and you do a little extra the next month. Very good. In other words, if you, your goal is 10,000 you come in with 9,200 instead of getting down on yourself you should congratulate yourself. Pat yourself on the back. Go to somebody else and say, give me a pat on the back, will you? The person is going to pat you on the back. So what was that for? So, well, I came, I reached 92% of my goal. So I'm going to set a little higher next month because it, it proves to me that how close I can get, I'm going to up it up a little bit. So you want to work from the positive. Mm. Instead of putting yourself down for not getting it, give yourself credit for what you did do. Ah. You have to take a, a leaf out of the book of animal trainers. You know, they, they have learned the real good ones. The old ones use the whip. The good ones do not. Mm -hmm. What they do with the animals, they only reward the correct action. They don't say anything if it is the incorrect action. But if the animal does the right thing, it gets a reward. Positive reinforcement. Nothing but positive reinforcement. And you need to do the same thing with you. You are way too hard on yourself. You expect all kinds of things that you would never expect of the guy next to you. You would give him some leeway, but from you, no, 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 it has to be perfect. First time out of the box, right? Very astute. Yeah. Be a little easier on yourself. Pretend that you are your own best friend and give yourself advice on that basis. So if your friend said to you, you know, my goal was 10,000 and only at 9,200, what would you say to him? You did a great job, 9,200. You see? It's not that hard, is it, right? No, it's wonderful. It's just... just Mentally put yourself in that position and you will know exactly what to do and what to say. The tearing down the negativity won't do you any good at all. It will only diminish you. And we want to do the opposite. We want to encourage, right? We want to encourage and praise. Whatever you praise increases. Mm. So we want to praise what we did do well. So visualization, to go back to that, is to visualize. Some people think it means that you have to see it in, in brilliant, exact color. Many people don't do it that way. So if you're one of the people who, when you close your eyes and you think of your goal, it is vague, that is perfectly okay. That does not mean you're doing it wrong. It just means that is your way of doing it. And there's no wrong way to do it. So what you do is you mentally visualize, think of your goal. You either can see it, or you can sense it, or you can feel it. Most people use the seeing part, but some people use the sensing part. They just sense. They feel a certain way. So whatever works for you is the right way. So that's the key to visualization, to use whatever works for you, to either see it, sense it, or feel it. And visualization has been used very powerfully by many, many, many different people. This is one of the integral parts that we teach. The story I read about Roger Bannister, this is an old story. Roger Bannister in 1954 was the first human being to run the mile in under four minutes. Now, here is something that no one had ever done before. As a matter of fact, the belief system was that the human body could not run that fast, that the heart would explode, literally. The doctors in those times, the blood vessels wouldn't be able to pump up. No, really. The belief system was totally, absolutely that this was impossible. So what I became intrigued with is how did he make this believable to himself? And I found out it was his coach that helped him. Because of course, his coach had broken down the mile in four one-quarter miles. And he said to him one day, he said, you know, I went over all the stats and I found out that at one time or another in the last month, you have run every quarter mile under one minute. Mm -hmm. If you can string together 
four quarters like that, you do the whole thing under four minutes. And all of a sudden, it became believable. Of course, this was something that he had already done. It was just a question of stringing them together at the right time. Second thing that he did is he visualized every night. Every night before he went to sleep, he visualized himself breaking the four-minute mile. And then after several months of this, he went out and did it. That's actually only part of the story because I've been telling you now for the last couple of hours how strong belief systems are, right? Now here's my point. Within 30 days, there were two other runners who did it. Mm. Within the next year, 37 other runners. Within the next two years, 200. Mm. Guess what made the difference? What changed between the people that could not do it and all of a sudden within the first year, 37 did it? What happened what to their belief system? What they believed. They changed, right? Yeah. They changed mm-hmm. their beliefs. So that's the only thing they changed. Nothing else changed. Nothing else. They already were world-class runners. They didn't change anything other than their belief system. That's how powerful your belief system is. So I want you to create a very powerful belief system about that abundance and prosperity is your birthright and is always available to you. No ands, ifs, and buts. (laughs) What if a negative thought comes up when you have a positive image? Okay, the question is, you guys should know the answer by now. What if a negative thought comes up? Cancel the thought, keep the image. Cancel the negative thought and keep the and create a positive image. You see, the thoughts, the the words are left brain activity, Mm -hmm. and pictures come from the right side of your brain. So the right side of your brain is creating the picture, mm-hmm. and the left side of your brain may try to run interference. Yes. <laughs> so you need to be aware of that and then be able to counteract it by canceling that one out. In other words, what you're telling your left side of your brain is, don't bother me, I'm busy. Amen. <laughs> 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 okay, I was uh, teaching a class in Florida, and I was teaching the Success and Prosperity Seminar. It's a two-day program, and I had a 93-year-old student in that class. Would you believe mm-hmm. to be 93 years old? Say, I want to learn more about abundance and prosperity. It's the right attitude to have, right? It's <laughs> <laughs> never too late. And I asked her, I was chatting with her during one of the breaks, and so I said, you're 93 years She had told me she was very proud that I'm 93. I said, you're 93 years old. I said, when you look back on your life, what happens? What thoughts do you have? What are you happy about? What are you unhappy about? What, what do you regret? And she says, when I look back, the only thing I regret are the things that I did not do. In other words, she did not regret the things that she tried to do and didn't work out. The things she failed at, the things that were not pleasant, she did have no regrets about that. But the only things that she did regret were the things that she did not do. So, when you make your list of things that you want to do, make it a nice long list. When you make a list of goals, I want you to use the idea that you're going to live forever on that premise. And that you can list all the things that you were planning to go and do. And then out of that list, narrow down the ones you have the strongest desire for. The strongest desire, belief, and expectation. And then those, go after them because... I don't want you to be 93 years old and tell me that you regretted not doing them. Because I'm going to give you no excuse, right? Many people give up way too soon. Way too soon. They try it once. If it doesn't work, they stop. Two times, they stop. It takes many, many tries to sometimes make it work. You don't know. It may take four tries. It may take six. It may take ten. It may take many, many tries. That's why it's so important to really work on your belief system that you're very clear on what you want. Because if you're truly clear on what you want, you see, it's easy to stay with it. If there's that doubt and fear, then it becomes easy to quit. So you want to make it easy for yourself to hang in there and understand that you're going to go out there and there's going to be resistance because if it's a new idea, people are not going to say, oh, yes, we'll do it. They're going to come up with objections. That's all natural all part of it, and you learn how to handle it because you're going to hear the same thing over and over again. So you formulate the exact right answer for it, and then you just keep on going till you find the right person. And if you look in history, the extreme would be Thomas Edison, 10,000 tries before the light bulb, right? How about Walt Disney, for instance, who tried over 300 banks before somebody actually loaned him the money? 
How many people would have quit after the second one? But if you truly believe in what you have to offer, you'll find a way. So let's finish this up by going over the five steps. Have a definite goal. Step number one, take all the time you need to settle on that one because nothing else is going to work unless you're sure on that one. So have a definite goal. So pick the goals that you have. If you have a list of five or six goals, you can pick short-term and long-term goals. Short-term would be, I want this within the next three months. Longer-term goals, I want this within the next three years, for instance. But pick definite goals. Be willing to do what it takes. We already explained that, right? Visualize your end result, not in between steps, but the end result. The end result, it is already done. You already have it. You already have achieved it. Believe it and expect it. And then the last step is be persistent. Yeah. I'm considering a career change, and I'm clear that I want to do work in TV production. Okay. I'm not clear about what the form of the job is. Okay. I know what my strengths are. So mm. how would you visualize that? If you could have the ideal job, what would it be? Um, it would be a job where I could use my creative abilities as well as my organizational. No, no, no. That's not what I'm asking you. Okay. What kind of work would you do if you could have your ideal work? Is there a position that exists currently that would encompass what you want? Assisting a director. Okay. That would be your goal? You see, you need to narrow it down. It is much too loose to say, I want to be able to use my creative abilities because you can use your creative abilities picking up cans of the street. That is much too loose. It's like to somebody that says, I want more money. You know, somebody says, I want more money, I give him a penny. <laughs> and they look at me real funny. I said, wait, you said you want more money? You have more money now than you had before. I gave you an extra penny, right? Yeah. So unless you know specifically how much more money you want, your brain says, it's happy, right? One more penny, you have more than before. Let's go on to the next problem. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in mind, it's very literal up here. So if you say, I want to be creative, that's much too loose. This is the job, assistant director. Fine. See yourself doing the functions of an assistant director. You know what they are, right? Yes. So that's the end result picture. Then in the meantime, follow through. Hang in there, you know, be persistent. Don't give up after the 4 to 68. The next call could be it. And if you are mentally focused on what you want, you know precisely what it is that you want, you're willing to pay the price for it that you want, you basically become unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Right? It's just a question of how, where, and when. That's all it is. Sometimes we feel like we need permission to go out and do it. Let me go on record of saying, I now, Hans de Jong, give you permission to go after whatever goal you have. Permission granted. Go get it. We will now start with the Silva mental training exercises. They are done with eyes closed and, of course, never in a moving vehicle. You will hear the alpha sound in the background. By listening to this tape at alpha, you will center yourself and learn at a deeper subjective level, making it easier and faster for you to achieve your goals. We will start this exercise with the 3 to 1 method. Find a comfortable position, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number three, three times. Take another deep breath and while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number two, three times. Take another deep breath and while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number one, three times. You are now at level one. This is the basic plane level that you can use for a purpose, any purpose you desire. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I am going to count from 10 to 1. On every descending number, you'll feel yourself going deeper, and you will enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. 10, 9, feel going deeper. 
eight, seven, six, deeper and deeper. Five, four, three, deeper and deeper. Two, one. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to direct your attention to different parts of your body. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your scalp, the skin that covers your head. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your forehead, the skin that covers your forehead. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on the eyelids and the tissues surrounding your eyes. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your face, the skin covering your cheeks. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate on the outer portion of your throat, the skin covering your throat area. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your body completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate within the throat area and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your body and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your shoulders. Feel your clothing in contact with your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of the skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your chest. Feel your clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate within the chest area. Relax all organs. Relax all glands. Relax all tissues, including the cells themselves, and cause them to function in a rhythmic, healthy manner. Concentrate on your abdomen. Feel the clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate within the abdominal area. Relax all organs, relax all glands, relax all tissues including the cells themselves and cause them to function in a rhythmic healthy manner. 
Concentrate on your thighs. Feel your clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. Sense the vibrations at the bones within the thighs. By now, they should be easily detectable. Concentrate on your knees. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering the knees. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your calves. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering the calves. Relax all tension and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on your toes. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on the soles of your feet. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on the heels of your feet. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. Now cause your feet to feel as though they do not belong to your body. Feel your feet as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet feel as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet, ankles, calves and knees feel as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet, ankles, calves, knees, thighs, waist, shoulders, arms and hands feel as though they do not belong to your body. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from one to three. At that moment, you will project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation. I will then stop talking to you, and when you hear my voice again, one hour of time will have elapsed at this level of mind. My voice will not startle you. You will take a deep breath and as you exhale you will relax and go deeper. One, two, three. Project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation until you hear my voice again. Relax. Relax. Take a deep breath and as you exhale, relax and go deeper. The difference between genius mentality and lay mentality is that geniuses use more of their mind and use it in a special manner. You are now able to use more of your mind and to use it in a special manner. The following statements are to be repeated mentally after me. My increasing mental faculties are for serving humanity better. Every day, in every way, I am getting better, better, and better. Positive thoughts bring me benefits and advantages I desire. Negative thoughts will never have an influence over me at any level of the mind. I will always maintain a perfectly healthy body and mind. I have full control and complete dominion over my faculties and senses at this level of the mind or any other level, including the outer conscious level, and this is so. Now get ready to work on one of your goals. 
Prosperity and abundance are natural. See, sense and feel that this is so. Now feel gratitude for all you already have. Now think of one of your important goals. Now see, sense and feel your goal as already accomplished. Every time you function at these levels of the mind, you will receive beneficial effects physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help yourself physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help your loved ones physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help any human being who needs it physically and mentally. You will always use these levels of the mind in a constructive, creative manner all that is good, honest, pure, clean, and positive. You will never use these loves of the mind to hurt any human being. If this be your intention, you will not be able to function within these loves of the mind, and this is so. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At that moment, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You have no ill effects whatsoever in your head, no headache, no ill effects whatsoever in your hearing, no buzzing in your ears, no ill effects whatsoever in your vision and eyesight. Vision, eyesight and hearing improve every time you function at these levels of mind. One, two, coming out slowly now. Three, at the count of five, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health feeling better than before. Four, five, eyes open, wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. We will start this exercise with the 3 to 1 method. Find a comfortable position, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number 3 three times. Take another deep breath, and while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number 2 three times. Take another deep breath and, while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number one three times. You are now at level one. This is the basic plane level that you can use for a purpose, any purpose you desire. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I am going to count from ten to one. On every descending number, you'll feel yourself going deeper, and you will enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. Ten, nine, feel going deeper. Eight, seven, six, deeper and deeper. Five, 
four, three, deeper and deeper, two, one. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to direct your attention to different parts of your body. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your scalp, the skin that covers your head. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your forehead, the skin that covers your forehead. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on the eyelids and the tissues surrounding your eyes. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate your sense of awareness on your face, the skin covering your cheeks. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your head completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate on the outer portion of your throat, the skin covering your throat area. You will detect a fine vibration, a tingling sensation that is there, a feeling of warmth caused by circulation. Now release and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your body completely and place it in a deep state of relaxation that will continue to get deeper and deeper as we continue. Concentrate within the throat area and relax all tensions and ligament pressures from this part of your body and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your shoulders. Feel your clothing in contact with your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of the skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your chest. Feel your clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate within the chest area. Relax all organs. Relax all glands. Relax all tissues, including the cells themselves, and cause them to function in a rhythmic, healthy manner. Concentrate on your abdomen. Feel the clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate within the abdominal area. Relax all organs, relax all glands, relax all tissues including the cells themselves and cause them to function in a rhythmic healthy manner. Concentrate on your thighs. 
feel your clothing in contact with this part of your body. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering this part of your body. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. Sense the vibrations at the bones within the thighs. By now, they should be easily detectable. Concentrate on your knees. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering the knees. Relax all tensions and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. Concentrate on your calves. Feel the skin and the vibration of your skin covering the calves. Relax all tension and ligament pressures and place this part of your body in a deep state of relaxation that is going deeper and deeper every time. To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on your toes. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on the soles of your feet. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. To enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, concentrate on the heels of your feet. Enter a deeper, healthier level of mind. Now cause your feet to feel as though they do not belong to your body. Feel your feet as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet feel as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet, ankles, calves and knees feel as though they do not belong to your body. Your feet, ankles, calves, knees, thighs, waist, shoulders, arms and hands feel as though they do not belong to your body. You are now at a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. To help you enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, I'm going to count from one to three. At that moment, you will project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation. I will then stop talking to you, and when you hear my voice again, one hour of time will have elapsed at this level of mind. My voice will not startle you. You will take a deep breath, and as you exhale, you will relax and go deeper. One. Two, three. Project yourself mentally to your ideal place of relaxation until you hear my voice again. Relax. Relax. Take a deep breath and as you exhale, relax and go deeper. The difference between genius mentality and lay mentality is that geniuses use more of their mind and use it in a special manner. You are now able to use more of your mind and to use it in a special manner. The following statements are to be repeated mentally after me. My increasing mental faculties are for serving humanity better. Every day, in every way, I am getting better, better, and better. Positive thoughts bring me benefits and advantages I desire. Negative thoughts will never have an influence over me at any level of the mind. I will always maintain a perfectly healthy body and mind. I have full control and complete dominion over my faculties and senses at this level of the mind or any other level, including the outer conscious level, and this is so. Prosperity and abundance are always available to me. I feel naturally abundant. I 
may experience unlimited happiness, prosperity and abundance. All my needs are met. I have courage. I take responsibility. I take action. I attract prosperity and abundance. I stay focused on my end results. I feel good about money, abundance and prosperity. Every time you function at these levels of the mind, you will receive beneficial effects physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help yourself physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help your loved ones physically and mentally. You may use these levels of the mind to help any human being who needs it physically and mentally. You will always use these levels of the mind in a constructive, creative manner for all that is good, honest, pure, clean and positive. You will never use these levels of the mind to hurt any human being if this be your intention. You will not be able to function within these levels of the mind and this is so. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At that moment, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You have no ill effects whatsoever in your head, no headache, no ill effects whatsoever in your hearing, no buzzing in your ears, no ill effects whatsoever in your vision and eyesight. Vision, eyesight and hearing improve every time you function at these levels of mind. One, two, coming out slowly now. Three, at the count of five, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Four, five, eyes open, wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before.